17 year in that work, I had reached maturity in that cycle. Something happened. The very first retrenchment happened. And my boss, who was looking forward to his 35 years, very diligent man, in fact, he was, got to the office, was in the middle of a meeting, and was asked to go. That is, we were in the middle of a meeting that he was chairing, and our director called him to his office, and what he was given was a letter that asked him to go. I think I reached the bottom of my decline at that point. And there and then, the question that came to my mind is, if it was me, what will will we do? Five years later, another person who was a colleague of that man reached 35 years, and they asked him to nominate who was going to um, take over from him. And he said, oh, I think you should let me sign a contract for a few more years. And I saw myself in him because I truly had no clue what I would do if I left that job. I started another cycle. And I started thinking, myself on it. I said, Dukwe, you are going to retire in five years. And I had to start thinking. At the end of five years, I didn't quite know what I was going to do. And then the bank offered me early retirement. Even though it was not the practice, they said, we cannot pay so many people. Come and go. And if you go now, we start paying you your pension. That's how I became a pensioner, even though I had not hit early retirement age. So I had an opportunity to start another cycle. I went through that cycle. I was very opinionated. I was running my bookstore. I refused to take advice from my husband. Uh, many things happened. I lost my capital, you know, all of those kind of things. And then I got to another decline. I had to look at myself and tell myself some truths and start afresh again. I closed down the bookstore. I started the Right Fit Marriage Academy. That's what cycles are for you. You go through, there is nobody who lives just one life. Many times you would have to go. You went to primary school and finished in university. That's just one cycle. There are many times you are going, need to go back to the school of life to begin to learn. Cycles reflect the natural rhythms and the stages of growth that families and individuals experience. Cycles highlight the recurring patterns of development and evolution. So the cycle that we are most familiar with in families is the natural one of birth, infancy, childhood, adolescence, adulthood, aging. And all of them present you with unique um, challenges. Now, Stages of growth and change. So you will be a young person and go through certain things, but even now that you have become an adult, you have not stopped. One, I was going to bring my first Samsung phone that I bought in 2003 when I opened my bookstore. Samsung made that phone. 
the only thing that phone which cost me a hefty 30 thousand 30 30 naira I'm, I don't remember but some really serious amount at that time could only do a phone call or a text message I still have it today the same Samsung was the latest model you know it has literally become everything. You can watch Netflix. You can talk to your children. You can have family meeting. You can, I, so they've just showed me how to use Google Notes and all kinds of things, you know, on my phone now. You can insist that it is the Samsung phone of 2003 that you want to be using. <laughs> Nobody will quarrel with you. The only thing is that it will be foolish to now be wanting to do bank transfer on that phone. <laughs> In order for you to do bank transfer, you have to get today's Samsung, you have to get somebody to show you how to do it, and you just have to upgrade, you know, to it. So stages of growth and change happen within life. Whether it is in the or it is in the individual cycles, or in the family cycles, what is sure is that you cannot remain the same. If you choose to remain the same, then it means that many things are going to happen to you. People and families change from when they're babies to when they're old. One of the interesting things that I always get told by young women when they have their first child is they say, ah, Nobody told us that it was going to be like this. And usually I say, you, you are not able to sleep at night because the baby didn't sleep. They say, yes. And I still have to go to work in the morning. I say, welcome to the world. Everybody who gives birth to a baby will experience that. So people and families change. And the ones we recognize are, you know, big life moments like your child enters primary school, your child enters secondary school, your child graduates, your child marries, your child gets a wonderful job, you know. So those ones we recognize. But those are not the only growth and change that you want to look at. Many things will happen to you in life. So, for example, I referenced COVID-19. Anybody who didn't know how to do a presentation online before, Skype had always been there. Zoom had always been there. But what has happened now? All of us have become pro proficient participants in all of those. I had clients when COVID-19 started who said, ah, me say, Hirim, we will just wait until after COVID-19 because you see, uh, this online thing, I don't like it. When COVID-19 refused to pack up, they came online and they did their sessions with me and they were helped just as they would have helped in person. Even today, I still have people who say, Mr. Hirim, you know, I would like to meet you in person. I remember a client recently who was coming all the way from I'm not familiar with Lekki, but you know, after Lagos business, after um, Pan-African University. And three times they attempted to come to me in Omoli. And three hours after the session was supposed to have started, they were still on their way. So I then said, if you must have an in-person meeting, can I refer you to somebody who live in your area? And that's what we eventually settled for. Environmental changes. When we all woke up on January 1, 2023, we had our financial plans. We had our family plans. We had a lot of things. I don't know about you. Right now, I, me, I don't even know whether I have a plan. The only thing I do every day is I say, Lord, you are the person who knows what the future holds. And I know you. Therefore, my friend is there. Many years ago, we sat down and we were fretting. So we brought our stock and we say, I, I remember saying to her, Runke, my stock is valued at 20 million naira. Why am I worrying? If I spend 1 million naira every year, I will still have enough money to last me till the rest of my life. Excuse me. I still have those stocks today. Where are they? 
what, what, what can you do with them? Essentially, the reason why you have to look at growth and change is because even though you think that there are many things under your control and you are trying as much as is possible to make sure they remain in your control, the reality is that nothing, absolutely nothing, is under your control. If you have had a reasonable measure of control in your life, what has just happened is that God has shown you grace. So you have a job that is paying you a pension like me now. I started receiving pension from 1st of February 2002. So I've received pension now for 22 years. And my employer has not failed. He sits me. Are there not people who retire? Those organizations are not paying them their pension. I have had good health all my life. The only thing that has made me to go to hospital is pregnancy and childbirth. I know people. My friend Irene Olumese, you all know her. What's the difference between me and her? Is it anything I did that gave me health and denied her health for all that length of time? No, it is just the grace of God. And so keep in mind what I said earlier. It is what God gives you that you can receive. Should we pray? Yes. Should we fast? Yes. But receive what God gives you and accept with grace the fact that he denies you some things. So it's important to be flexible and then to be strong when you go through all of this. What are the foundations that you need in your life? The first of them is self-awareness and self-knowledge. I'm a Nigerian. There is no need for me to be wishing that what is happening in America is going to happen in my life. It would be a good thing to be able to get a mortgage. But the reality in Nigeria is that you have to find your cash to build your house. Accept it and ask God for guidance of how that will happen. Know yourself. Know where you came from. Know your family of origin. I am very privileged, as I said, to have been brought up by a man who had no family. His parents, my father's parents died before he was 10. And when, he was, when his parents died, he was in the family compound. His step-mom's uh, family came and take, took away his siblings. And he was on his own. God showed him grace, and somebody came and picked him up. He saw other people going to school. He wanted to go to school. And then when he wanted to go to school, the wives of the man who picked him up said, Bible says that those people who don't work should not eat. Since he wants to be going to school and not working in the market where they sell, then he will not eat. God stepped in and showed him grace and brought somebody his way who offered to pay his school fees. So, my father became somebody who said, the family that I did not have, I want to create it. And so, I grew up in a family that has healthy relations. Was it something that I chose for myself? No. But it was a pointer to me, two things which I'm going to leave. One, if you are blessed like me to have had that origin, it's very important that you study it and know how it came about so that you can pass it on. If you are in the group of my father that you didn't have the opportunity, you now have my father's example that says to you that where you are coming from is not what should define you. You can find your way. So that is where self-awareness and self-knowledge, because you do need to understand the path that brought you to where you are today, the things that have contributed to who you are today. It is when you know that, that you will know the gaps and you will know how to seek to fill it. You would also know your strengths and you would know your weaknesses. The second thing is a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. The reason I put self-awareness and self-knowledge before a relationship with God through Jesus Christ is because many of us actually 
salvation brings to us because we don't know our needs. So if you offer a solution to somebody who does not think they have a problem, that solution would not be powerful in their lives. You need to know who you are. You need to be able to see how God had already stepped into your life even before you came to know him. You know, I love Ephesians chapter 2. that you know see the people of the world the God of this world has blinded their eyes and then he goes on to say there is me but for the grace of God essentially the only reason I'm not like them is because God took me and then he went on to remind me that see eh, it is by grace that you were saved there is nothing you didn't qualify for it. You didn't benefit. That is, God just looked at you. So he could very well have looked at the other person and left you as well. And so that's what you want to focus on. Your relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And when I talk about your relationship with God through Jesus Christ, I'm not talking about your attendance at church services and programs like this. I'm not talking about the amount of fasting and praying that you do. I'm not talking about the um, all of those things that are Christian activities. I'm actually talking of how well do you know God and how does God know you? And I'm going to share with you that. Because for me, when I, re when I became reborn, before I married my husband, John 17 chapter 5. I'm a very curious person. So I was asking questions like what is sin? And that's why I was reading the Bible. And I was also asking this eternal life they are talking about. What is it? And I saw in John I think 17, 5. And Jesus said, it, this is his words. This is eternal life. That they may know you, the only true God, and your son Jesus Christ who you have sent. That they may know you the only true God. That is, know God as you would know your friend. You know, my friend is sitting there now. <laughs> if she talks about me, she will say many things. Why? For more than 1988 till now is how many years? 36 years. Runke and I have been in and out of one another's lives. If I smile, she can look at my face and know why I'm smiling. If I frown, that's the kind of relationship that God is inviting you to. The third foundation that you need is familiarity with the entire Bible. Note that I didn't say Bible study. Familiarity. Being so familiar with the entire content of the Bible. Sometimes people say to me, Mommy Mo, you're very peaceful, nothing worries you. The real reason that nothing worries me is because I have read the Bible through. In fact, I have an annual habit for about 15 years now to read the entire Bible. And you know, when you read the Bible that way, here is what happens to you. You know, when I, if I stand here and tell you about Abraham, everybody will be saying, yes, Abraham is our father of faith. When you read the Bible sufficiently, and you read it very frequently enough, it will suddenly dawn on you that 25 whole years passed before Abraham saw what God said he would say. In fact, Abraham saw part of what God said he would do. After God had told Abraham that his family will be in Egypt for 400 years, that God started the process out of Egypt. That's when you will get to Hosea and you will wonder, how could a man live with a prostitute? Because God said he should live. And then you will read Ezekiel, and you will read Isaiah, and you will begin to see that there are many things that people don't see, but God see. 
essentially, you become familiar with God. You will see things that ordinarily you would not see. And when God is passing through your life, you'd be able to recognize him passing through your life. So familiarity with the entire Bible. And last, uh, then understanding your engineering. In family systems engineering, we say that as I'm opening my mouth now and talking to you, essentially, you are hearing my 65 years. So you are hearing my upbringing. You are seeing the school I went to. You are seeing the husband I have married and lived with. That's what you are seeing. Now, you need to understand your engineering. And bide me, I'm going to send to you an exercise that we make people do, tree of life. And we ask you some questions just to help you to think through your life. Many of us are who we are today because of where we're coming from, but we're not conscious of it. So we don't know how to make amends in places we should do, and we don't know how to be firm. The last one is tools and skills, which people talk about, you know, so how to think critically, how to relate with people, and so on and so forth. But if you're self-aware, if you have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, if you are familiar with the entire Bible and you understand your engineering, a lot of things will be okay for you. What is the role of the Bible? Why am I saying that you should be familiar with the Bible? You know, there is something we do. You will note that I didn't say pray. That's because I think already that the average Christian in Nigeria spends Understand. Me is who you need to understand. When you know me and you know how I think, you would be able to interpret what is working in your marriage and you'll be able to figure it out. About business. No. The Bible is available to you for you to know God, who he is, how he thinks, so that, you know, when by... Bible tells us that God shows the children of Moses, the children of Israel his acts, and he showed Moses his ways. What it meant is that Moses can figure out that, ah, this is what God will do. There are many things we fast and pray for, waiting for God to tell us his will. <laughs> Whereas reading the Bible would help us to know the mind of God. So guidance is available. Comfort is available. When we face challenges and losses, the Bible offers words of comfort. You know, one thing that I like about the Bible, and I'm grateful to God, God is not embarrassed by messes. Messy lives. The whole Old Testament is messy life. <laughs> it's only God that could have written the Bible the way he wrote it. Because if it is us, we'll be trying to make sure that God's reputation is not spoiled. And if God could write the Bible and show us all of those messes, because remember, everyone who had a messy life in the Bible was somebody that God had already picked and said, this is my person. The reason we have messes is because we still live in a world that is broken. There are still a lot of people who don't yet know Jesus Christ, and so they've not been healed. The Bible offers us examples. 
There is nothing new under the sun. If you are not having a child and you are longing for one, is the mother of Samuel not there? Is Sarah not there? Is Elizabeth not there? If you are somebody who found yourself pregnant before you got married, is Mary, the mother of Jesus, not there? If you are somebody who your brothers looked down on you and actually sold you to slavery, is Joseph not there for you to look at? If you are somebody who out of favoritism, your parents preferred another child to you, is the story of Esau not there? If you live in a country where the people are not honoring God, is Daniel and Nehemiah and Esther, are they not there for you to learn from? So there are examples that show you how people in the past dealt with all of the life challenges that you're going through now. You know. So guidance is there, comfort is there, examples are there. Encouragement is also there. The Old Testament has been very great as an encouragement for me. You know, because when I just look at it and say, ah, how could God fold his arms for four whole hundred years for the children of Israel to be in Egypt when he could just have saved them like that? When God appeared to Moses in the bush that was burning and did not burn, God said, I have seen their tears. I have heard their cries, and I am come down to deliver them. People of God, the children of Israel were still in Egypt for another, I think, almost 80 years before Exodus landed. But the promise that God made to Abraham, did he not fulfill it? He fulfilled it. And so the Bible is there for our encouragement. The Bible provides us with strength and courage to face our life's challenges. The Bible gives us hope. So sometimes when I think about Nigeria now, I think we're so far gone, I can't see the way. Then I remember, I say, well, God, but you are sovereign over the affairs of men. I don't need to know how you are going to revive Nigeria. I just need to have sufficient hope to go out of my house and do all of the things that I need to do. You are carrying the big picture. Let me be living my own life. And lastly, the Bible provides us with community. We see people who are like us. We can also share Bible. Right now, on my journey of reading the Bible annually, I've had a couple of young people go along with me. And I'm so grateful to God because now many of the things that was confusing them is no longer confusing them. Because when they read some place and they go on, they eventually find answers to the questions that they have. Particularly, what is the role of the Old Testament? The Old Testament is very important in your work with God. The Old Testament provides you with a foundation for understanding God's character, his promises, and his plan for humanity. When you are looking at your life and you are looking at your relationships, look at God and his relationship with Israel. When God started his family, Israel, he wanted them to be different. I used to be very perplexed about all those laws and everything. But recently, the Bible project in their videos is helping us to understand that those were just, God wanted the people around to know that these people were different. And that's why he gave them those laws. And so there are many things that God is asking you to do as well. It's not that he doesn't know it's difficult for you. It's just that he knows that people need to recognize that you're different from them. If you decide not to commit adultery now, it's not that God won't forgive you. The reason God is saying don't commit adultery is because God wants the people to know that everybody who belongs to me will not commit adultery. 
If somebody treats you badly and you forgive them, the reason God is asking you to forgive them is because God wants people to know that the people who belong to me, they behave in a different way. My character is in them. My way is in them. So the Old Testament provides us with the foundation for understanding God's character, his promises, and his plan for Earlier on, I said there is no need for you to be defensive because the world is going to continue going bad. If you think it is bad now, it's going to become worse. You see all those things that you are reading in Instagram, they are just about to multiply. God has told us that things will become bad. So what are we supposed to be? A light that is set up on the hill. Why did I step onto social media? I stepped onto social media and I decided to be a public person just to counter what was being put out that marriage was not anything that anybody should be interested in. Now, I had to make a decision. I could go to be fighting the people who were saying marriage is bad and to say you must not say marriage is bad. I told myself, will I win that battle? No. I just ignored them and faced my own lane. And I keep saying marriage is good. And then they come and say, how can you be saying marriage is good? You are deceiving people. I said, thank you. You don't have to follow me. You can go and follow the people who are believing what it is that you're doing. When you begin to understand God from the Old Testament, you will face your lane because you will know who you are. The Old Testament also provides us lessons from history. You know, it's very important for you to read the story of Israel if you are a Christian because what God did there there's a question we need to ask ourselves. Right from the Garden of Eden, God knew that mankind needed to be saved. Why did God wait all those years before Jesus came? I like to think that it is because God knew that even if he sends Jesus Christ, if we don't have a picture of who he is and how he relates with mankind, we will still not be. So he, he, he spent all that time him, demonstrating through him. In short, God was the first practice predictive programming. So God gave us the Old Testament to program us to be people who we truly understand God. So life and the storms of life are shaking us. People are trying to make us think all kinds of things. That pre-programming will make us to stand. The Old Testament also provides us with heroes and heroines to inspire us to persevere in faith. When I was having the challenges in my own marriage, surprisingly, Hosea was my model. I used to ask myself, what did God say to this man? that made him to be living with a prostitute. <laughs> it takes something, I mean, it takes something to make somebody live with a prostitute continuously and still be a holy person and still be treating that person with kindness. When I was having challenges in my workplace, Daniel was my role model. Even though much was not said about him, I used to ask myself, <laughs> How did Daniel stand in the Babylonian court with all those people saying all of the things that they are saying? And yet, he didn't turn back from following God and he didn't join them. So these stories are there for you. How did Ruth come to the decision that she's going to leave the familiarity of her home and follow this woman to go and meet a tribe. How did Rahab look at the two spies and say, it is better for me to lie to the king than to 
give up this man? What kind of things was going on in their life? Those are the kind of things I like to look at. So when you see that place in Hebrews where it says the hall of fame of faith, that's the reason why they're there. Because God knew that when we will be in the time that we are going to be in, it will be hard to stand if we did not have all of this before us. So the Old Testament, if you are somebody who has not been reading it, please take some time and just read it. Not Bible study, just become familiar with what is in the Old Testament. And so in the light of all of this, what should your next steps be? Number one, accept your human finitude. You see, you are a human being. You have limitations. You cannot do everything. Marriage takes 24 hours. Being yourself takes 24 hours. In fact, there was an exercise I wanted you to do, and I would like you to bring out your pen and paper. Just begin to write down now everything that you are. Begin with, I am me. I am the daughter of my parents. I am the sister of my siblings. I am the wife of my husband. I am the children. I am the president of this. I am the secretary of this. I am the neighbor of this. Even you yourself will just be wondering, how am I doing it? And you are collecting more. You see, you are a human being. You are finite. You have limitations. It's not a sign of weakness to accept that you are human. In 2020, I met a fantastic young girl who made my life easy. I call her my accountability coach. I pay her 5,000 every month just for her to check up on me and make sure that I do all the things I'm supposed to do. So she asked me to do plan for the year and I did plan for the year. And I now told her, I said, it's very difficult for me to make this plan because I have many things to do. And then we find out that I volunteered a lot. She then asked me, why do you volunteer in all these things? I didn't know. At that time, I think I was volunteering in about 20 things. So she said, why don't you take some time to think about why you volunteer? And I went and I realized that every time I get into a community and there is a leadership gap, I step into it. And I looked at all of the places where I was volunteering and that was the reason why I volunteered. So we collapsed everything about me into volunteering. And we now said, how many hours a month will you give to your volunteering activity? And that solved my problem because I went on and resigned in many places. So accept your human finitude. The next thing is embrace change and growth as natural aspects of your life's journey. In 2024 now, I'm having to grow. Why? Because I look at myself, I say, okay, if God gives me life, I have all this time. I look at my children. I was not a good parent when I was younger. I was too much of an individual chasing my life. They are now adults. How you parent adults is different from how you parent children. So I invite them to lunch and we go together and we see it, you know, and then, you know, I ask what's going on in their life and I say, I'm sorry. There were things I should have taught you when you were a child, but because I was not wise, I didn't teach you. I desire to teach you now, and I understand that the way of teaching it is a, I cannot force you, but if you are willing, let us walk this path together. The reason I want you to learn it is because, see, I'm paying the price for it every day. So, you know, that is the thing. And I'm having to learn how to do it. Why? Because I grew up in an era where all you just do is tell your child, do this, and they will do it, even if they're 50. How dare you say? Then I will say, am I not the person that gave birth to you? If it is this breast you sucked, you should listen to me. That's how. So now I'm having to learn how to do that one. So embrace change and growth as nat natural aspects. Recognize that each season brings new opportunities for learning and transformation. 
by the time my business failed and I closed it down, I was absolutely sure that I had failed in life. In my profile, you read that I'm on the board of Oasis, publishers of Africa Study Bible, they are an American company. I'm also the chair of the board of Africa Speaks 2018 Trust. That organization is solely about promoting sustainable um, and profitable Christian publishing in Africa. How can Madam, who ran a bookstore for 13 years, whose capital was completely wiped out, now be the person that everybody is consulting about publishing? I've never even, I don't even, the only thing I know about books is enter a bookstore, buy it, and go. But that's God for you. It, each season brings new opportunities if you are open to learning and transformation. When I was invited to join those boards, I told them categorically, I don't see why you are inviting me. I don't see what I'm contributing. But now, 80-year-old men who have run successful companies in America, when we finish board meeting, they say, you share such profound wisdom. Another friend of mine is the person who helped me to accept that I'm actually a wise person. She said, Dupe, what is true? You see, this, when you do, I say, okay, okay. Now I'm a comfortable board member. Note that the people in your life, both at home and at work, they're dealing with their own life issues too. Sometimes your husband is not offending you because of you. He's, he too is, my husband is 76 now, so as I'm struggling with my 65-year-old issues, he's struggling with his own 76-year-old issues, and I am sometimes at the receiving end of that. My 38-year-old son, he's struggling with his life to survive in this Nigeria, so sometimes my interaction with him are not about me. It's just that, remember what I said in the beginning, all of us want to be free. And yet, my freedom stops where your nose begins. So note that you are dealing, the people in your life are, deal, are also dealing with their own life issues and trust. Lastly, I encourage you to build a strong support system that is rooted in love, in truth, and in love, trust, and mutual respect. You are blessed to be in sister power. Here is what I want to challenge you. Sister Power Gathering is a group. When you come in, you are meeting many women. Determine in your mind to find at least two or three women in this group that you will get closer to and you will be vulnerable with. What sister power is giving you is an environment that you walk into and you're almost guaranteed that the women here are safe people. But your coming to sister power is not sufficient for you. You do need to have people that you're going to build a strong support system with that is rooted in love, in trust, and mutual respect. Now, in Africa, most of we are not taught to believe that our family of origin should be that for us. And that's the reason why many people will say, can you imagine my, my, my sister is not even taking an interest in me. My brother is not even, they're just wanting, please. If your family of origin members do not have the capacity to provide you with the support system that is rooted in love, in trust, and in mutual respect. You can create a family of choice. A family of choice is you consciously looking for people. I came with my adopted daughter. My adopted daughter chose me about 11 years ago. We attend the same church. And she came to me and said, Mommy, I would like you to be my mommy. I said to her, I cannot accept this responsibility lightly. Let me think about it. When I decided to accept it, I called all my family together and said, we have new family member. And I'm so grateful to God 
When my parents were alive, she would go with her children to my, my parents, and her children would be comfortable with my parents, and my parents were comfortable with her. She chose to make a family of choice. Her own mother died when she was a teen. She could have continued to be sad at the fact that she had no mother. But instead, she chose to appoint a mother for herself. And God has given me the privilege and grace of being her mother now and of being a grandmother to her own children. In fact, it's interesting because even her siblings literally also now consider me their mother. So, I shared with you the story of my father, a man who looked at where he was coming from, and he decided that it was not going to continue, and God helped him. He was not a believer when he did this. You are a believer. You even have more power. If you would go away with some truths here today, the first of them is this. Defending yourself, being protective, is a sure way to land in defeat. You need to open. You need to receive what God is giving you through people, no matter how weak they are. I also said that you need to have self-knowledge. You need to be self-aware. You need to nurture your relationship with Jesus Christ. You need to become familiar with the entire Bible, with the entire Bible. If you go to church every week and your pastor is a fantastic pastor, like Bidemi, that's 52 weeks in a year. Bible has 66 books. That means that even if she's preaching from one book every week, she still would not have preached you the entire Bible. When you now have a book like Matthew that has how many chapters, how is it possible for her to preach one chapter? You owe it to yourself to become Bible literate. I'm confident that you have heard what God wants to say to you. I've said many words, but I know that for each of you, he knew exactly what he was saying because he knows where you are at and he knows where he's taking you. You don't need to worry about the thousand and one things that I have said. Here is a rule for figuring out what God may have said to you today. You know, our conversations with God are ongoing. So you have come here today. You want to ask yourself, where, why, what did God say to you last? What did he talk to you about? And so how does this connect with what it is because God's goal for you is to answer all the prayers you are praying but more importantly God's goal for you is to present to you to himself holy, pure and without blame so the primary things he's saying to you are things that you have to do about transforming your character if you are following the transformation of your character with God, you are likely to end up in all the places that he wants you to be in. Thank you and God bless you. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> mm. Clap now. This is for class brain. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. God bless you, Ma. I'm really grateful. Thank you, Ma. For all of you that don't that are New Testament believers. Shame I keep telling you. For all of us, you know, most of us are spiritual beings. So we don't recognize that we need our brains to process these things. I keep telling you, sure you've heard. If you do not go away, if you're not going to go any, away from here with anything Mommy Hiram said today, defensive living is defeated living. 
defensive living. That is everything you are, no matter what they say to you, you have an excuse why you should not be. Oh no, it's this. Oh no, it's that. Hello? Let me do the pastor. When he has done the first class brain. Let me do pastor. You are defeated already. It's not you will be defeated. You are already defeated because you pre once you, all you do is protect or defend or, pro or try to give excuses, you have locked yourself up in a prison nobody set up for you but yourself. If you're not going to go any go away from here with anything today, I want you to hear. Now, why you, say you have your human finitude, you also have the capacity to engineer your life. I've said it too many times. What we call the will of God and we will not move is only 20% of our lives. The remaining 80%, God has given you the permission to figure it out. And that's why two people will be faced with the exact same thing and they will have two different approaches because you have permission to figure it out how it works for you. May God grant us capacity. Yeah. I said may God grant us capacity. Yeah. Have you been blessed so far? Yeah. Huh? God, why did I not make first class? How many years later? She said she did youth service. 90 click women. 1980. That was 10 years. <laughs> uh, how many of us know that first class in 1979? It's not first class today now. Seven, 65. Her husband is 76. They still believe that they have a journey ahead of them. You, when you turn 40, you, your life don't finish. They tie rapper. And it's where they tell you, you know, yeah, say Jesus knows. We Jesus know. All of us are lying against both the devil and Jesus. They are waiting for us. <laughs> but honestly, I know this is serious, but if we don't infuse these things, you know, I don't want people living here feeling like Kai. If there's something else that you would not, if you're not going to go away with anything, recognize that all of us have wounds. All of us have scars. I hope that you know there's a difference between a wound and a scar. Your wound means that you have not healed. Your scar means that you have healed. She said if she had known, she would not have taken voluntary retirement. That can become a wound. You know that, right? And my, I know people who took voluntary retirement, even later than you, that have died today. Because they just couldn't figure it out after that. She worked in the same CBN with you. So in the end, what you make of your life is your responsibility. What I make of my life is my responsibility. May God allow your spirit man to hear today. In the name of Jesus. I'm going to say this like three times before we are done. I want to introduce to you something we're going to do. My job was to make sure that we have a flyer depicting it. But I dropped the ball. I'm sorry. But we're going to... We're op opening the doors to something called second wind. Second wind is a faculty we are opening, a learning hub we are opening for women 50 and above. Actually, that's, that's the demographic. But if you are 40 and you don't want to get to 50 before you learn it, we will let you come in. It's not going to be free because you've heard mommy you're hearing for two minutes. Because in my mind, that's two minutes in all the eternity that you have. How many of you want to sit in a class with her? I want to sit in a class with her. 
I will never forget when she came to talk to us about marriage and one sister power like this. This is her third time she's come to speak as sister power. That first time was at Sheraton in Ikeja. Oh my God. She took, when she finished, I was like, they say, marry, I married. That's this woman they talk about. But I could relate because my brain did not go to sleep. My brain cells had to be working to understand. I want to sit in class with her. She has something under her belt that I don't want. Failing at a business. <laughs> at least I don't want at this stage of my life anymore. I've been, done it before, but from now on, I don't want it. So I want to learn those lessons. So second wind, if you'd like to be part of second wind. Again, no, you will pay. Oh, oh. If you're a member, a member of sister power, that is your dues paying member of sister power. Because we're introducing dues. You will get that to be um, sit in those learning hubs at a discounted rate, yes? But if you decide you don't want to be a due Spain member of Sister Power, it's still okay. We will give you the opportunity. You will pay the full amount. But imagine, Mommy, a hero in the room. When you listen to my big sis, Ike, you understand. Imagine her in the room. Imagine women. Alero, Salero has finished one journey. Because I know she walks, she stepped away from employment and she's running a business now. Imagine them in the room telling me, I'm still trying to gather my Torah Kobo together, what to do when I get to that place. Because even if you wanted to continue to do and do and do, at some point you have to drop certain things and you have to do certain things. So we're introducing second wind. Second wind, in fact, I'm going to write a book on second wind. I'm, I, and I'm not, it's not going to, I'm going to co-author with all of them. They don't know yet, but we are going to do the book together. So uh, just to hear people's perspective on doing it, on how to do life when others begin to die. How to do life when others begin to die. So if you'd like to be a part of Second Wind and you'd let, like for us to um, contact you when we take off. Um, a sheet of paper will go around the room. Please write your name and your real telephone number. Don't write it and put e, a, a, a where the, um, seven where there's supposed to be nine. We're not going to ask you for money. We're just going to send you the information. You can make the decisions by yourself. Hallelujah. Have we been blessed so far? Those of you who came, clap for yourself. The only people online that I'm pitying for are the people outside Lagos. If you're in Lagos, I, I have no pity. I have, in fact, I don't have any compassion inside my, for you. Because you had the opportunity to sit in the room. And not just to listen, but to actually interact with them. But you chose to sit on your couch. Your bomb has created space when we look at that your couch bomb number one second you know is there they have their names because that's where you sit and you hold the phone like this so we're sorry we're not sorry if you're in lagos and you didn't make it it's not that you are ill we are not sorry but for those of you who are not in lagos i will do you if you're not in lagos so if you're in lagos i will not answer you but if you're not in lagos we are recording we may not have video, but we'll send you the audio. If you're in Lagos, you will pay for it. If you're outside Lagos, you will get it for free. Praise God. Mr. B, your eye don't they chew. You don't know how much, how much, for the first time, let me say it. You don't know how much dollar B now. <laughs> Hallelujah. We're going to go to our second speaker shortly. The questions will come at the end. Please begin to write down your questions. And Tony will come and introduce to us our second speaker so that we can get this thing on the road. Like I said, I'm not going to teach more than 15 minutes when this all is done because you'll be too heavy to go home if I do. God bless you. I'm back. Good morning, everyone. Good morning again. How many of us are, by a show of hands, how many of us are foodies? I am. How many of us like food? I love food. You have, no, don't, don't, don't look at the body. I actually love food. <laughs> uh, our second speaker 
popularly known as Mommy IQ. I cannot, I dare not call her by her name. Good morning, Ma. You'd be hard pressed to find a Nigerian foodie out there who doesn't know of Mommy IQ Uko. She is a prominent branding and marketing figure who has represented some of the world's finest and largest brands. This Lagos, I don't know why it says here, this Lagos local, but mommy, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, you're not local. This Lagos local has helped put West Africa's heartiest, healthiest dishes on the map, thanks to her food blog, IQ Plata. You can check that out later on all the social media platforms, IQ Platter. Oh, is it one? Okay. One Q Platter. I, okay. I apologize. One Q Food Platter. Through her careful guidance that inspires others to take up cooking the African way, Mommy IQ has connected an entire community of eating enthusiasts around the dishes they know and love such as suya meatballs, never heard of that, chicken carrot stew, and seafood tomato pepper soup. When she's not consulting with marketing organizations or performing boardroom functions, Mommy IQ blogs regularly on one Q food platter about new recipes and educates readers on where ingredients come from and how to use them and even shares documentary style videos that honor simple joys of cooking. Inviting an inventive mommy EQ's cooking style is one that has that is admired and celebrated in Nigeria. She constantly manages to push the envelope while paying tribute to Africa's most classic dishes, encouraging others to experiment in their own kitchen and share their unique twists. Her book, Memories on a Platter, is a documentation of the rich and diverse food culture of Nigeria. My sisters, please help me make welcome the gift of God in the life of Mommy IQ. I'm sure we can do better than that. Good morning, ladies. Please, can we be seated? Um, I think, first of all, I wanted to find out if the seats out up here are reserved for any particular persons. If they are not, because we are about to have a conversation, so can I just crave your indulgence for people to please come? Because there are people at the back, and um, it's going to be a lot of interaction here. We have seats in front, so please, if you can relocate, that would be great. Um, because for me, there's something also about women. By the way, happy International Women's Day or happy International Women's Month. March, we are celebrating ourselves throughout March. But just on that note, uh, before I start, I, I don't know what it is about um, taking the front seat for women. You know, we get to conferences, we get to events like this, and we just talk ourselves at the back. Sometimes I'm wondering, is it so that we can escape from the event quickly? Or indeed, um, it's something about confidence, I don't know. But uh, ladies, let's take the front, front seat if you want to take the front seat. Now, why am I here? I think it started, um, was it last week or so? She had, for those that uh, joined Commanding Your Morning, you might have heard her on one of those mornings when she was talking about her challenges with plantain and how she bought plantain and the plantain got spoiled and she had to buy, you know, another, you know, bunch of plantain for her husband. As I listened to her, I said, oh my goodness, knowledge is power. And I then thought, understanding how much plantain costs now, I said, should anybody really allow plantain to go spoiled in this economy? I mean, I said, well, I needed to help Bidemi. So when that um, morning session finished, I sent her you know, a message saying, Bidemi, you know something, you don't have to 
lose plantain. I mean, it's, it's, it's a criminal offense for your plantain or your yam to get spoiled in this uh, day and age. So I, I did give her a few tips and some other tips, which is why she immediately said I should come. So if you follow her on certainly Instagram, you would have noticed that the flyer for this program did not include me at the beginning. It is based on that conversation that I am here. And so as we proceeded to chat about today, I then asked, I said, Bidemi, what exactly do you want me to talk about, knowing the several caps I wear in my life today? So she says, and I read what she said. She said, I want you to speak, to help speak to adjustments within the family, considering the economic things we're in, the economic time, sorry, we're in. Also to give us practical tips on how to navigate our different roles as our seasons change while keeping our lives productive, while keeping our lives productive. A friend stopped by uh, the house this week. Um, I, if I figure, maybe I'm slightly older than her, but she's retired anyway. Uh, so I said, um, Balaji, you know, so what do you do to these days? I knew she was into some, you know, uh, sale of, um, I think, farm produce or something. I said, my dear, I don't do anything anymore, Jerry. Let me just sit down and enjoy my pension. I thought that was interesting, and that actually speaks to the life of a lot of women. But let me say something, and I'm not saying walk until you drop dead. But for me, the perspective is, so long as God has given me the strength to do something, and if in the process of that, some money comes, am I not, use, am I not supposed to use that money for the kingdom? So when somebody throws her hands in the air and says, I'm just going to sit and enjoy my pension. By the way, your pension wasn't supposed to be for you alone. So for as long as you have the capacity to make that money, you, you really might not need the money, to be honest, at a certain age and at a certain stage or at a certain cycle <laughs> of your life. But the kingdom needs that money. So how about that as a consideration? My sister Modupe was here proudly talking about how she's 65. And I said, my goodness, looks like I'm the oldest in the room then. I turned 68 this January, so um, I'm looking forward to, to celebrating 70 soon. Ladies, some jeans have worked for me, a bit of discipline in how I eat, but I think a lot has to do with um, jeans. So, Let's start the conversation. I might not be talking about cycles and water view, but you will know how I have transited. Um, if I can have the first slide. Okay, it's up there. It's a bit, um, okay, I, I think I'll use my phone just so as to track um, things easier. Um, that is a bit about me. Um, started my career right after my NYSC with a food multinational. And one of those people that just spent all of her career in one place. Um, as I tell my story, I know just like Modupe said, you pick up something from there. The, what I'm sharing with you is what I share with a lot of women and young women. But before I go on, please, can, can I see by raise of a uh, show of hands, people that are still in their nine to five? Okay, a couple in the room. How many are entrepreneurs? Okay, more entrepreneurs. Okay, I'll be speaking to the two, but please understand that my life has been more in the corporate world, so that's where my reference would come from. So like I said, um, I started my career as a medical delegate in one of the multinationals and then uh, proceeded and grew along the line uh, to become uh, one of the, the first female director in the company. I mean, this is a food company, global food company that has been in Nigeria for over 
as at that time, 40 years, and no woman had been on their board. So I retired eight years ago, and I'm cutting short my career, um, because if I go on that, we'll be here for long. I saw that my time here is supposed to be 45 minutes, <laughs> so I'm going to speed through this. I retired eight years ago and um, started my company, um, Entold Marketing Limited. But before then, five years to retirement, uh, the children were out of the home, emptiness. I had time on my hands. So the question was, what do I do with my time? Unfortunately, or should I say unfortunately, before that time, you didn't have too many women uh, telling you what to do, how to navigate life, and how to uh, get onto your next cycle, so to speak. But, well, was this downloaded to me by God? I guess so. So, five years before then, you know, blogging had just started. I mean, I didn't even know what blogging meant, to be honest with you. I learned from my children. Like I said, please pick the tips as I go on. Um, as at this time, my company it's, had not really gone on social media like you know brands have gone at this time. So guess what? There was no, nowhere to have learned from. So I had to dirty my hands, humble myself with my children, and learn. And so I started my food blog five years before I started. I, you know, I retired. And why did I start at that time? Okay, my background nutrition and dietetics, that's what I read in school. Picked up a lot of marketing from the company I worked with. And so I knew I should be equipped you know, to do this. But you know, I was going into the terrain where the average age there was about 28 to 30. So you can imagine a 50 something, late 50s woman getting onto social media, getting into the food space. At some point, I said, are you, are you about to commit suicide here? What, what, are you, what are you doing? But I went on anyway, started my food blog. And so by the time I was leaving, of course, food photography, I learned from my son because he's a, he's a photographer, he's a fashion photographer. So he taught me how to photograph. Can you imagine somewhere along the line, I needed a camera. He had an old camera. Remember, I paid his school fees. <laughs> I might have contributed in one way or the other to buying that camera. By the time he wanted to sell that camera, he sold it to me. Anyway, I humbled myself and bought a camera. I was the one that wanted to do food photography anyway. So I learned, I learned from him. And so my journey started. By the time I was retiring, I had had a substantial number of following on Facebook. Not so much on Instagram, but by the time I came out, I then took a few months to just follow any food blogger I could find on social media because I wanted to understand them. I wanted to understand the space much more than I had done uh, when I was doing my nine to five because of course you won't have so much time. Anyway, fast forward, let me talk about today. Suddenly I have 116,000 followers on Instagram, never promoted organic, Facebook 90 something thousand, and much more than that, I believe I'm a voice in that space. But remember my story is that I started before I retired. So I planned. And why did I do this? I told myself, when I retire, I don't want to go to the reception of any organization to ask for jobs. I know how it works. By the time you're sitting at the reception, in your 50s or 60s, and the phone rings, the security will tell the people, ah, there's one mama here that wants to see you. And they say, who is that? Even if it's a company you had worked you know, in before, Mrs. Zuko, ah, what does this woman want to? Yeah, that, that's what happens inside. I mean, I was inside, so I knew what they were saying you know, from outside. So I didn't want to put myself in that space. And so I said it had to be social. 
And it's been an interesting journey, I must say. And of course, the rest, um, you know, published a book now. Um, and I'm on the board of, um, you know, some organizations. I'm also a podcaster. Next slide. We are talking women. We are, we're here as women. That is what our life looks like. Growing up, like Modupe said, our fathers were the breadwinners. Today, everybody is winning that bread including the women. And sometimes it becomes challenging for the women. No wonder we have issues. Uh, you leave home, you're a mother, you're a wife. You get to the gate of your organization. You become the manager, the director. And so you're permanently taking off one cap and putting it back on. And there's, there's bound to be confusion there, trust me. You just need the grace of God to ride that tide. Something, I think my screen has got, okay, you're still, next slide, please. Something I always tell women is, um, what does success mean to you? Is it material wealth? Is it marriage? Is it highest level in your career? Is it money? Is it position? Is it social status? Or is it living God's purpose? Next slide. In all of this, we are permanently adjusting one way or the other. Like I said, we start to behave like an octopus. You're holding so many balls in your hands and you, sometimes you don't know what's, which one uh, you should be throwing up or which one should be throwing down. Then we now start to talk about uh, balance. I always say there's nothing like balance in that space. But we are adjusting to, to things. Next slide. In adjusting, we are adjusting to work and career. We are adjusting to our well-being. We are adjusting to self-care and personal time. We are adjusting to family, social life. Social life there would include even our Christian life. In this balancing act, you have to be clear about your choice. Somewhere in my career, I was told to, I mean, this was um, a couple of years before I retired. You know, they were touting uh, the idea of me becoming the MD. I think at this point, I should tell you the organization I worked for. Um, I worked for Nestle Nigeria at the time. So there was this idea, uh, you know, of um, expatriation. You know, you have to go to this country, you'll be there for a couple of years, and, and yes, another country, and finally, you know, you might just come back to Nigeria. And maybe, maybe, it was a maybe, you could be the MD. At this time, my children were already out of the house. In the, I think one more person was in secondary school, the other two were in the university. So my thought was, I'm going to be somewhere, my husband is going to be somewhere, the children are going to be somewhere. And this work has a limit. Whether I like it or not, at 60, I need to retire. So by the time I come back and there's nothing left in that thing that I, you know, build, what happens? And that was how I opted out of that opportunity. Um, retirement could have even been more comfortable for me today, trust me. But the choice was mine. And that was the choice I took, which was not to respond to that um, offer. So in the process of balancing, we have to cost correct when things are tipping too much on one side. And here I'm talking to, even if you run a business and you have to leave home, even if you're a pastor, <laughs> and uh, for days you've been on, all you have done is you provide food, and this, you've not even asked for those of us that are married or are in a relationship, you've not even asked your partner, how are you? You know, that simple question, how are you, makes a lot of difference because we can be going on and on in our own world without recognizing that we are part of. I say find joy 
in the journey to the top. And here I'm talking to people in their corporate life, in their working life. Sometimes we're so fixated. I need to be the MD. I need to be this. I but why don't you enjoy the journey before you become the MD? Stay on your focus. Once you have defined where you're headed, do everything to stay there. I might not be able to go into details because I'm conscious of time. Um, next slide. Define your career or entrepreneurial goal. Even for people that are in an enterprise, when will it end? You know, I find people in businesses and you have not quite decided, am I dropping it at 60 or 70 or when? I hear there's some challenges with people who own schools. I don't know if there any, is anybody who, who owns a school? Okay, there's nobody. Do you know the vision of a school is your vision and not that of your children? not that of the teachers that are in that school. So if anything happens to you, what do you think happens to 1,000 children? And by the way, if you don't have a board <laughs> for that school, what happens to those children? Does your goal serve a bigger purpose other than yourself? Does it impact other people for good? Define milestones if you're in a career, you know, define milestones. Timelines for your choice, you know. Um, if you're in a nine to five, like I said, that, because that's, that's been my experience. I mean, I was in Nestle 34.5 years, the only organization I worked for. But by the way, I tried many times to leave. And I'll advise anybody that is in a nine to five, please try to leave from time to time. What that does is it helps you to value yourself. I, I sat with many MDs of similar multinationals, had dinner with them, ate free dinner, but decided to stay where I was. Because I told myself where I was going to might even be more complicated than where I was. Today, um, women in particular, maybe men as well, you find yourself in um, which, maybe marketing. You're in the marketing department, for example. And you know the average age in marketing this is about 30, 35. And you're already hitting 40. And you're in marketing. And you are not the chief marketing officer. I would say pivot to <laughs> you to deal with three generations could be difficult because you're managing millennials, you're managing Gen Zs. You, you know, you then get to a point where you don't understand your colleagues. That, and those your colleagues are 28. Sometimes I say, it's, it might just be time to say, mm, can I, you know, have a stings in HR? leave marketing, go somewhere else, or leave the organization and go somewhere else if you can. Today, you have to have a lot of skills. I mean, I started marketing, stayed in marketing and all my life, but it doesn't work that way anymore in today's world. You have to experience a lot of skills. Sometimes it just requires that you want to be the MD, leave your organization, go somewhere else. Get that skill, go another place, and then you get to the top. You know, in my time, it was you climb vertically. Now you have to go zigzag to get to that top. If you stay vertically, the HR person will say you've stayed too long. Five years maximum, you are already too old. You know, when you come with years of experience, nobody cares. It's about what skills do you have within those five years. If you're five years, you're doing the same thing, the same... What else do you have to offer? And for those of us that have said, you know, maybe somebody like me who stayed for so long, and you say it is a career. Like I said earlier, increase your staying power. How do you, how do you last long in a place if you decide to last long? Leverage 
technology. You know, women, we are, <laughs> I think um, maybe this generation is better than my mom's generation or my generation. Um, if there's a problem with the setting of the TV, some of us don't know how to navigate those channels. We don't know how to navigate those channels. So not to talk of AI, not to talk of using chat G, uh, GPT. It, it makes life so easy. Uh, and so it shouldn't be something of age. Today, you know, I, I, I needed, to, I was attending um, an event. I think this was December. I had written my speech. I wasn't very, I wasn't feeling it, like they say. Of course, I passed the thing through chat GPT, got to the event, I mean, read a powerful speech, thunderous clap, and I was telling myself, ah, thanks to chat GPT. <laughs> if you're still in a career, speak like the position you aim to be at. Um, dress the part sometimes. I know these days is um, we dress casual, and that is good. But you want to be the chairman of the board, it has to be done differently. Of skill in your professional area. And you know, when I say of skill, it's not until you're just in a career, even in your business, even in your business, are you, do you know the new ways you know, you, do you know what, it's, what happens if I decide to dye my hair blonde? What does it do to the hair if you're a hairdresser? Can I, can I know new ways of telling my client to moisturize and all of that? I do something in the mornings. I take out an arm. I tell people, Google is your friend. There's so much information out there. I'm not a financial expert, but I sit on boards. I'm even a chairman of audit committee. Never have read finance. But what do I do? In the mornings, I take out one hour. I go to YouTube and check the latest uploads of financial lectures. One hour, sometimes 30 minutes, and I'm done. And therefore, I go to a board meeting, and I'm sitting there, and I'm talking intelligently. The last thing you want to do when you get to my age is to get to a room and be looking at people from one mouth to the other and not being able to say anything. <laughs> Let's go, you know, move on. Let's talk about family. I don't know if that's where we are. Yes, because I'm getting to... I think Hemodipa said something, gave us a few tips. But let me, I'll also talk to women in career or even entrepreneurship where in this space children husband family for women especially when you start to climb and progress be mindful when you come home with that year rubber jeep and your husband is still walking with um, Maybe Lagos State Ministry, middle level. You people had your um, second-hand Camry. That Jeep is going to cost Wahala. Every Sunday, we have to ride with that Jeep to church. Do you sit on the owner's corner or so go sit on the owner's corner? They, you know, they're little things, but you find out that it's, it then starts to disrupt things in the home. Sometimes you're even asked to come and relocate, expatriation. I mean, I know it has happened to a lot of women. Your organization says, uh, we're going to, you need to go and head our operations in Dubai. Hmm. Excitement, you run into the the ladies' room, you're screaming, you're shouting, you're praising God. How do you manage breaking this news at home? 
a junior colleague had just been transferred to Ghana and um, she came to me excitedly and told me. So I said, oh, have you told your husband? She says, no, not yet that she will. I said, so the children, what would happen because they're in school? I said, ah, no, I'll go with them. Matter of fact kind of thing. So I said, oh, and he agrees. Eh, she'll be, he'll be coming. You know, she was already, she has mapped out everything. <laughs> I said, well, I think you should sit him down. I think you should have a conversation. I think he, sh he has to buy in that you want to take his children somewhere else. There are things that, you know, we, we do sometimes and um, I just, school fees. Maybe there was a time business is like that. He, he's in a business and it was going yo-yo. He couldn't afford uh, to pay. You were the one picking up the bills. He now can afford and you're doing Madam Capable. Well, <laughs> it, things are th these are things we need to check ourselves, you know. Time will not permit me, but that area, if you're in a car, even if you're in business, I remember my parents <laughs> Retired from Lagos, my dad said he was going straight back to the village, no problem. My mom was a nurse. Okay, he was magnanimous enough to allow her one more year because she needed uh, one more year. She was working with the military hospital in Yaba then so that she can get her gratuity. When she went back, then it was allowed. She, wanted, she opened a patent medicine store. What was my mother selling? The simple Panadol and multivitamins, you know, for the villagers. And my dad wanted to control the account of this thing. <laughs> this is a man that was an assistant director in one of the ministries, but he wanted to control us. My mother said, everything in that shop is inside my head. <laughs> Ladies, we know what I'm talking about. And all I'm saying is that when we start to advance financially in status, let's um, carry everybody along in the family, including the children. Self-care. Certainly we know what this is. Aging, you can't avoid it. But certainly we can do a lot to take care of ourselves the food we eat. When I tell people I eat maybe one and a half time, you know, one and a half meal, so to speak, sometimes two. And by four, I've closed my kitchen. That's when I stop eating, 4 p.m. I can, I can feel the silence. I can feel the silence. Yes, but do, 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 I, look, do I look as if I'm starving? No. Maybe it's my background as a nutritionist and dietitian. So there's no, I know, I know my, my activity level from that for. If, if, you're, if you're a night nurse, okay, it will be different for you because you'll be working. But for me, I know that from that point, I'm not, I'm not carrying cement in the house. So what do I need the food for? But also what is on your plate? What is on your plate? It, those are things we need to start to think about. Um, and I'm saying this because, <laughs> see, yeah, old age. There's something my, my, my brother tells me. He says, I mean, he's my immediate senior. He says, look, when you get to a certain age, the day age cooperates with you, if it cooperates with you today, he said, do all you need to do because tomorrow you're, you can't guarantee that it would allow you. That is what it is. Sometimes you wake up, is your knee. And for women, when you get into the phase of menopause, you're sitting in a boardroom. The AC is blasting. You are sweating. I can't, I can't, I can't go through the whole, <laughs> the whole drama of um, aging. But, and the other thing, ladies, the hospitals are not friendly today. 
it looks like there is a conspiracy, or maybe they sent a memo to all hospitals, I don't know where the doctor's here, that once somebody drives through your gate, they should not leave without dropping money. So they direct you to the lab, you must have malaria or typhoid. From there, they collect the money from you. So what we have control over is what we put in our mouth. We can try. Of course, physical exercises where you can and rest, rest in between all of this. Please do your medical checkups annually. Do your medical checkups annually. As we are told, there are quite a lot of things that can be picked up on time. And then grooming, we know what this is. We are in an era where we wear a lot of wigs. Ladies, keep those wigs clean. You know, I sit, I sit with people, people sit next to you, and what I'm, and you know it's hot these days. This, the, the leftover sweat is there, you know, so let's um, try. I know even the attachments are not coming easy. They are more expensive, so we are repeating those things. But um, I think they, they, they also sell hair perfumes if we can't wash them. But it's, it's absolutely important. Now, preparing for life outside work as I round off. Let's start from what will you do when the whole up and down, what, what will you do at 60? Let me put it that way. For people that are nine to five, have you thought of it? How, how am I going to keep busy? Because when I hear, um, yeah, you know, by that time, the children, you know, would be married, I'll go for Mugo. The price ticket, the ticket of, uh, the, uh, sorry, the price of tickets. Okay. And by the way, how long can you do that for? What else would you do? And that thing that you want to do should start now. Whatever that passion is, that interest is, start it. I started food blog, I didn't know where it would end. Today I've published a book and I've been called to have conversations in different quarters. Start. And decide at what age do you exit? At what age do you stop doing that business and maybe go on to some other thing? But think, what exactly am I going to be waking up to do? If you're in a job, what's your side interest? I was with an organization the other day, and I asked the employ employees, I said, besides this job, what else do you do? It was shocking that most people wake up, and it is that job. They go home. They go back to that job. There has to be something else you should do that interests you. Whether you are in paid job or businesses, professional networks are important. And I tell people, please network down. That's more important than looking, you know, looking for mentors up there. Trust me, there's so many mentors online that you don't even have to know them, you know, physically. But network down. Why? If I take myself, for example, unless people declare their ages, nobody my age should still be in any system. Because retirement is at 60. So who are the ones calling the shots? People that are in their 40s and 30s. And therefore, you should surround yourself with those people. Now, if you're, say, 30, then you should be having some 20-something, early 20s in your circle. You would need them as you go up. If you can, which is what I'm benefiting from, look for things like board roles, if you can. They're helping me to hedge against the devaluation of the Naira, so to speak. Financial literacy is where a lot of us women are just not there. We, we just push it to the back. Money will always be there. No, money will not always be there. Like Mudupe said, you know, even if you look at what the value of what my pension was eight years ago, it's not the same value today. Even if your spouse, if you're married, can supply, but trust me, it's getting difficult for one person to cope. 
So what other things can you do? And as you get older, you should be thinking of what we call passive income, which is something is there, is dropping with it. Because the energy to wake up and go to your shop and run after some time, your body will tell you different. So what can you do now to start to sow something there that would help in the future? The last bit, I'm not sh I don't know if um, it would be clear. Can we have the last slide before I go on to the home tips? This is a slide I always put up, you know, that summarizes all of these that I've been talking about. And when I say how to win, you know, here, please pardon me, I'm talking about the corporate world to a large extent, um, about developing and renovating yourself. In the area of technology, ladies, we can't win. No. You know, now, if you travel, there's nobody there that is printing boarding pass for you. You have to go. You have to key in things yourself. You have to know where to drop your luggage. You have to check yourself in. Get your children to teach you some of these things. Or else, we are going to be dated, whether we like it or not. Um, I, I said things about build your personal brand, but this is about somebody like me. You might not need to. Um, and I tell people in the corporate world, what's your social media footprint? W Let's do a simple exercise. Write your name. Sorry, go search your name on Google. Just Google your name and see what comes out. And I tell people, especially if you're in your career, nine to five, if what you see there is not what you like. <laughs> do something about it. You know, because what happens is if you go looking for a job, the first thing the HR person does, they check you out here. And what, as you're sitting in front of them, they know you already. Like I said, join organizations, use social media to your benefit, decide what... Why am I on social media anyway? And what, you know, should this bring to me? I talked about, um, you know, build strong relationship, strong career plans, and write out your big plans. Uh, this, this is important at the beginning. Now, let me jump from here and go to what um, myself and Bidemi shared, and I just give a few tips. A lot of this you can actually get on my timeline on social media, one Q food platter. This is not exhaustive. I think as I was coming here, I just said top of my head, what are things I think would be beneficial to us as ladies, particularly at this time, in terms of helping us manage funds a bit? I talked about um, how do you preserve yam? A tuber of yam now, I think is you know, 3,000, 4,000, if you get a good one. So what do I do, especially if I'm going to use it for boiled yam? I peel, I cut. go back in your house. Of course, we know time savers like beans. You wash beans and store. Rice, weevils, do you know how to manage that? When you buy a bag of rice, if you have space in your freezer, wrap it the bag or you know distribute it into buckets. Leave it in the freezer for like a week. It kills all the weevils. When you take it out, sun it, and that's it. You keep Nothing happens to that rice again. 
Always keep onions away from potatoes. Have you wondered how come Irish potato gets rotten quickly? When it stays too close to onion, there's a problem. When you're planning to eat fried yam during the week, maybe on Thursday, and you were boiling yam on Monday, boil the yam you want to use for fried yam on Thursday. That boiled yam, put it in the fridge. When you want to do your yam chips, just cut the boiled yam. It's the most fantastic yam chips you'll have. Crunchy on the outside and soft on the inside. It gives you about the same effect as those women that make dun dun on the streets. Banga juice, for those of us that are from the south, is buy your palm fruit in bulk, press out your juice, freeze when you want to cook. You don't have to be pounding like my mother used to. I buy foods a bit from outside Lagos, but that's me. I hardly buy smoked fish in Lagos. This morning, I received some oil from Joss. I buy from Kano, and all of these I'm shipping through GIG. But that's me. And why do I do this? Uh, please, ladies, we need to be mindful of what's going on. Because as much as we're talking about health, you know, before we thought, oh, manufactured uh, foods, are the ones we should be careful about. Even your tomato, your palm oil, your chicken, everything is risky, so to speak. I, did, I you know, did an experiment recently, if you go to my One Q Food Platter page on tomato. About a, almost two months ago, I bought some tomatoes from a farm and I kept this tomato, and it lasted six weeks in the fridge, fresh, without me freezing it. I was shocked. And I decided to do the same experiment with a market-bought tomato. It was only one week. It was already moldy. The same condition as the market, as the farm-bought one. A lot of pesticides are there. Your beans, I tell people, if I buy beans and I don't see insect, I'm not buying. You know those nice ones in the shop? Clean, no insect, no. There are a lot of pesticides there. That's why you don't have insects. If, there, if the insects don't die, then you don't have sufficient pesticides and therefore it's okay for me. <laughs> you know, after all, insects are protein. But what you know, is recommended is that you soak the beans if you buy the other one that is insect free, drain out the water before cooking. The farmers are doing what they need to do, which is to store their grains and they must use pesticides. Sometimes some of them don't know how to use those pesticides and they just spray it all over. In eating, there are eight grains, and I'm, here I'm going just you know randomly. Things like millet. Do you eat millet? Maybe not. Most people call it bird's food. I eat it, I you know, boil millet, and I mix it with rice, just to provide a lot of fiber for me. If you have uh, family members, and some of us, maybe at a certain age, we are avoiding salt in our diet. It's, I mean, it's a recent experience I'm having, because I'm having to do more saltless cooking for my husband, and my goodness. Is a different learning of how to create that flavor. So I buy a lot of bones from the market, beef bone, boil, drain out the water, just put them in bottles and leave it in the freezer. And I use that to cook because I can't use seasonings, I can't use salt. So that's what I use as base. But again, some advantage for somebody like me coming from the southeast where crayfish, fish would also add something to um, to my meals. I'm just getting through this as far as food is concerned. I don't have the answer to everything because I know it is getting challenging and challenging. But if we look inwards, does Oga have to eat that shakia and everything? He doesn't even need it. 
So if possible, tell him the nutritional advantage of not eating so much meat and rather give the meat to the children if you have young children in the house. As I round off something totally unrelated to food, please declutter your lives. We have the nag of keeping things. I, I guess if I search through some wardrobes here, I show okay from five years ago, I should be still there. And after that event, you have not used it. When I left corporate life, I then, I then told myself, my goodness, why did I do so much in terms of clothes, shoes, this and that? I've had to give them out, and I'm doing that on a daily basis. Why? Why should I? You know, when my mother passed and I saw the things I needed to deal with to tidy up her wardrobe and suitcases, it was a painful experience. Let's try and declutter our lives. If there are things, you know, I know some time ago Bidemi talked about, there are people who need these things. Can we just bring them here or give them to our churches? Let's not leave those clothes, those shoes, those bags. In any case, the shoes, the heat and cold today is dealing with our leather wears. When I go out these days, I go with two pairs of shoes. Why? Because you might just walk up these stairs and the heel is gone. The strap is gone. So <laughs> let's not keep too much. Let's declutter kitchen wares. What have you? TV. You, you hardly go to that sitting room to watch that TV. We had used it to decorate the sitting room. Nobody's watching it anymore. Your children are here. So do you need that TV in that room sitting there? Or is it just so that when they come in, they say you have television in your house? There might just be somebody who has a salon and she needs TV in her salon to entertain. Maybe you give it to that young lady who just opened the salon. I think this conversation would even be more interesting when we ask questions. So I'll stop at this point. Thank you very much, everybody. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus. 68 years far. Anyway. I'll do I'll try my best not to be sorry for myself this afternoon, but I don't know. Oh gosh. You see that Jeep, that Tierra Jeep conversation. We may not have it today because and thank you, even if you tell them they won't hear all until the castle are bust. Thank God, these days, 7 p.m. I don't answer my phone anymore. So you can't even call me when the goes bus bus starts. And she said, when the man is now capable, all that your superwoman moves, stop. I keep telling people, the test of what you do as a woman is embedded in your response to it. I have never, I know that Men sometimes have to really struggle to pay school fees. How many of us know that? I've never seen a man struggle after paying school fees, goes to Ushudi and say, I just paid school fees. They don't talk about it. But me, if I pay <laughs> the, in, what, no, the money to buy the exercise book that they will write, the, not, the, the account of the school fees on top, Tomorrow you are just you're talking to me. Your last to be your face is kind of dull. Say my brother. Now that notebook why buy. <laughs> Who wants to confess? Because it's not our thing to do. It's not our thing to do. When I say it, those of you who decided that you want to use your head to carry the word that you shouldn't be carrying. You'll be like, hey, oh, it's good. Is it not because you're married to Pastor Mark? He's first Mark Modi before he becomes Pastor Mark. And I think that, I actually think that once he walks through our gate, he becomes Mark Modi. There's nothing you do that makes him Pastor Mark. They had. But when we say these things, they're like, eh, is it not because you married a man who's empowered, who's doing it? So, um, because, so how can you not tell me? 
That's the problem. Because at the end of the day, okay, do it and shut up. You won't let me hear what. If you can do it and shut up, no problem. But because you don't have the capacity to do it consistently, this is not saying don't help. Mommy, mommy, if I'm lying, just tell me. This is not saying don't be a helpmate. That's what the Bible calls you. Help me, not the, not the takeover meat. <laughs> <laughs> that conversation she just touched it and she said you know what I'm saying but we will pretend like now we don't know what we are saying there is small thing you are boiling why are you boiling you are boiling because you are doing what is not convenient for your makeup to do we have women in peculiar situations single parenthood situations it's different. These things we're doing, I will say it, oh, I've been saying it forever, is emasculating the men. We castrate them without actually castrating them. And then when trouble comes, you don't understand where it comes from. We don't understand where it comes from because he might not be telling you that. It's because when you pay school fees, you tell everybody. Because then you will answer, you're not even grateful I'm paying the school fees. So he will just keep quiet for a long time. Then one day, all you said was, ah, your trouser has faded. Are you, he will scream and you look like, ah, trouser and money fade. And it's a fact. The reason why that is happening is because he has stomached your jeep that his friends will first of all look at him and say, ah, your wife don't buy car again. That your wife don't buy car again has said 55 things that he can't come back home and say to you. And then one day he just said, let me use your car. Be like, No, maybe you were sleeping because that's where it starts. It was, you were sleeping and he takes the car. And the only reason he took your car because you don't want them. It's because your car is the one closest to the gate. And he thought, if I pull this one out and then I do this, I'd probably be late. I'm just going to go down the road and buy bread and come back or something. And you, you had your car zoom off and you woke up. And like, who take the car? I say, it's daddy. You begin to report him to the house help before he, he comes back. And when he comes back, say, ah, I went to the bakery. I saw really fresh bread. I bought that one you like. Thank you. Then he does the math. Because again, we won't say, why did you drive my car? He does the math. It's because I drove her car. Those conversations, let's have them. In my mind, it's always better to have the conversation with your spouse, no matter how inconvenient and uncomfortable it is, so that everybody knows where they are standing. So that where you don't want assumptions, assumptions don't happen. Because do you know the world is so excited that our marriages are packing up? That's why 45 unbelievers married will pack up in one month. Nobody talks about it. The pastor's PSPA, it's not the pastor, the pastor's PSPA, his wife left. When they want to do the headline, Pastor B. They miss PSPA's what? Is that not what happens? Because it makes sense to them that they should laugh at us. Because in our minds, we have put ourselves up to be sacred and special and all of that. And now it's even happening to us more than it's happening to them. I do not think that more marriages are breaking in Christendom. I actually think that because they are used to marriages breaking, one marriage in Christendom that breaks is equal to 150 in their eyes. And this is why these conversations we're having right now and everybody is uncomfortable, you're squirming in your chair, must be hard. I'm going to stop because we need Starlera to come. My mother taught me, she said, the meat you will not chew and swallow. Do not divide it with your teeth. That thing heavy for my hand. So no matter what we're saying, I ask myself, 
I feel use my, I, if I go chew this thing, if I don't go chew them, I can't use it to touch my mouth. It's native intelligence. You need it. It's even bigger than artificial intelligence. Let's be careful how we do. Our children, more and more of our children are growing up and they're saying, I don't believe in marriage. Do you know why? The unbelievers' children are excitedly getting married. Believers' children are not that excited. And the reason is because the unbeliever, they already know their ghost bus bus is community matter. When they start, all of us will stand by our window. They, they're not hiding it. Your children and our children are finding it difficult to buy into this thing because they will see us do passive, aggressive misbehavior. And then when we get to church, one, we, were caught, we were eyeing each other in the car till we got to, to the parking lot in church. When we come out and we watch, it be that day because even though we're not talking at home, on Saturday, the wife will prepare the clothes we're wearing to church on Sunday. So we wear to be and go. And then in the car at the back, our children are, uh, they're talking to themselves. Come on, me and daddy. After, when you say, uh, you, uh, uh, auntie, 26, what did they happen for that? I say, mommy, it's not marriage that makes a person. That's why we will continue to have this conversation as unconventional and as uncomfortable as they be. When I sent two people to you in the last two weeks, did they come to you? Because this, me, when I, when I, if you, if, especially if you never marry, 80% of the time, if I can't say you know if you marry. So you get, you get really, because I, yeah, so I'm sending her, them her way because I don't have time for all this. She's very patient. Even as she talk, as she was talking, can you not see that she's patient? Compare her to me. I don't have that time. But brethren, or oh my dear sisters, this is our journey. God is counting on us. We need to know that whether we're mothers, whether we're wives, whether we're sisters, everything about our, our life is a mandate from God. So let's pay attention. I hope you guys know, you ladies notice I did not talk about the food. Because I mean, I can't not close my belly at 4 p.m. <laughs> I wake up at 3 a.m. hungry, self. If I close at 4 p.m., I will not wake up. <laughs> but do you get it? But she has a point. I just am not ready for that point yet. <laughs> hmm? Well, small, small. Well, so for those of you that are ready, I hope you remember that point too. Me, I cannot even lie because I have to go to heaven. I'm not ready to close <laughs> to close my kitchen at 4 p.m. But I'm trying. I promise you, I'm doing 6 p.m. You know, worst case scenario, 7 p.m. I'm trying really hard. You know, so I'm going. I'm getting one day. Shall I? Shall I? Shall I? By the time I'm 68, I'll be telling you I'm closing my kitchen at 6, 3 p.m. By the grace of God, <laughs> ladies, have you been blessed? Are we still streaming? Are those online getting, they're listening? Okay. So even if you're at home, stop paying school fees because you want your children to go to Corona. When all of us that went to Latif Jokonde Secondary School, we are still doing okay. If your husband can't afford it and you can't do it and be quiet, don't do it. Keep your money. When you die, your children will divide it. Because what they want to do, you will die. But if you will not do it and be nice about it, then it means that you really shouldn't be doing it. Because if your helping is what is causing the further, further stress, then it's no longer help. The devil has set you up to break something. Nothing in you and around you will be broken. Amen. In Jesus' name. God bless you. Please let's clap again for Auntie Ike.
For those of us wondering why I'm smiling, our next uh, facilitator happens to be a big sister of mine. I've known her for over half of my life. Don't ask me how old I am, I'm not telling. Sister Alero Adetun on Nosso Day worships and serves at Ikoi Baptist Church. She's the Chief Executive Officer at AAO Salash Limited. She's a seasoned human resources executive with over 30 years of experience in the oil and gas industry. She has global experience in leadership and human capital development. As an expert in human capital development, Sister Lera has defined, managed, and led the strategic delivery of human resources and business agendas. She's the general manager Human, no, she was the general manager, human resources at Seplat Petroleum Development Company. She worked with Shell in various HR roles as the venture integration risk manager responsible for integrating non-technical risks in project promises. Sister Lera holds a Bachelor's of Arts in English and an MBA from London Business School and is also a doctoral student at the University of Warwick. She likes book. She's a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Personal Management, CIPM, and a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Personal Development, CIPD, UK. She is definitely, and I can attest to that, sold out to Jesus and passionate about women. The Lord has given her a vision for Christian women on the platform of Women at Work. This network seeks to empower women to be Christ transformed and God glorifying in all that they do. Please help me make welcome the gift of God in the life of Sister Alero Adetong on Nosso Day. I'm sure we can do better than that. Good afternoon. Good afternoon already. Um, really a privilege, and I'm humbled, um, Pastor Gudemi, for this opportunity. And I think you are right to put me last, because I needed to hear from the two women that went ahead of me. I think I've, um, it's been a great learning opportunity. I'm not sure Stiko remembers me. Um, I, when I was with Seplat, you came to facilitate a session for us in, in Abel Kuta and your daughter. So when you were talking food, I was like, I remember, I kind of remember that um, food story <laughs> um, from way back. And so lovely to hear from you, ma'am, and the journey that you've been on. And I think um, they already put me to shame because I have no slides. <laughs> it tells you that um, it's supposed to get uh, better and more technology as you, the younger you are. I'm not 68. Because I have to declare, my gray hair already makes people think I'm so old. Meanwhile, if I, I think the last time I met Saiko, I think she's even reversing the years since I met her. She definitely looks younger than the last time I saw her, and I seem to have acquired all the years. But when I'm 68, I'll look like you. <laughs> Thank you so much um, for this privilege. And now I'm meant to be talking about circles and cycles, and I'm meant to speak around the professional angle and just really focusing on careers. Um, but I guess, you know, as um, has been mentioned earlier, we're integrated beings, right? So the work and career is a part of life. I always say these days we talk about work-life balance. In my view, there's no work-life balance. That's my, there's life. And work just happens to be a part of it. So making sure that there is room for everything that we are called to be um, is really important. And so as we go through this, I believe I'm speaking to sisters, yes. daughters of Zion in the house. Yes. So I think, again, as much as possible, we'll be establishing the foundation of our conversation on the calling of Christ upon our lives as his daughters and what he expects of us. Dear Father, even as we come into this time with you and as we learn of you, I just ask that you give understanding, you give insights, and help me to speak your word 
for each woman here for their season in life. Thank you so much, Father, because you're the one who establishes a matter even before we know it. And you've already made a way out for us. You've given us insights. You've given us understanding. Lead us into your truth in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I think as I was going through the topic, the issues of um, the cycles first, and then I'll talk about the cycles. Um, the cycles begin to talk to the faces of life that we go through. And I just think, you know, that's just God's way of perpetuating life. You know, as one thing is dying, something is being birthed. So it's just that transition, generation to generation, time from time, that is life. It all goes in cycles. And I think the key thing is recognizing, and I think Ecclesiastes couldn't have said it any better, just recognizing that everything follows a pattern, but it also works in its own season. And so when we look at our own journeys, and I think as been alluded to, we are different faces in that journey. Some are just beginning, some are probably midway in, and there are some of us that think we're at the end of it, but really just beginning. Because everywhere you move to, you are beginning again in a different phase. So the, the, the circle just continues um, as we go on. But I think one of the key challenges with the circle of life is that it is not change, it's transition. So you really don't know when one is stopping and another one is starting. All you begin to see is that there's less of this and more of that until you then proceed and then you begin to find out that, you know, things have actually changed around you without you knowing. I think um, when we look at our normal, um, as women, menopause doesn't start one day. It has been starting for years. It's just that there is a time in which it begins to manifest. And so also we need to recognize that with every phase of life, it really doesn't happen in one day. So the key thing is what is the consciousness that allows you to pick up the symptoms as that transition begins to happen? Otherwise, you might just wake up like me and I think... Um, Sister Iko spoke to that, and you just find out that the things you could do yesterday, you no longer can do. And you begin to wonder, where did time go? I think one of the things that I always, um, that amazes me is I know, as a child, the rate with which I wanted to grow up, Kai, and what was my motivation? It was meat. Because when we are children, they share meat for us. I could not wait for the day that I would now be eating my own meat by myself. In fact, when I get to that stage, it's orishi, orishi, the shaki, body, everything has to be complete because now I can do it. Then all of a sudden, when I thought I had arrived, doctors say cholesterol is high. So before you know what's happening, you get back to that space where you are now sharing meat again. Look at Sister Ikeo, Ikeo telling us that you can no longer eat after a certain time. And it is not just because she's saying it. I noticed for a period I couldn't sleep well at certain times. And I realized that the earlier I eat, the better the sleep. So even with nobody telling you, your body begins to tell you that things have to be done differently. And so as we Come, let me get back to my instruction, which is the place of work. It's recognizing also that when we come into our careers, when we come into the place of work, is a transition. The key thing is, I'll talk about the essentials that I think you need to navigate that process. But as I was thinking through this um, um, there was something that came to my mind, and I know that God's calling upon our lives is that we're fruitful. That is his primary agenda for each and every one of us, that we do bear fruit um, in his call. He sent us out to bear fruit, and he also tells us that he's the source that makes us fruitful. So I'll talk about the faces of being fruitful. And the first phase, and just linking that to careers, just in terms of where do we start this journey um, when we come into the place of work, 
and I call it the season of sowing. Where do you start a matter? You start a matter, the journey of fruitfulness starts in the place of sowing. And what does it then mean to sow in the place of work and our career? I think if I look back to my career journey, I ended up in HR, and I must say that when I was in school, I had no idea what HR was. I did not know anything called HR. I studied English. My plan was study English, do youth call, and go back to study law. Because in those days, if you are not a lawyer, a doctor, an engineer, you an accountant maybe, you didn't go to school. So it was just to go back and do law. But one of the things that came my way was in the place of youth service. And I was then posted to what was called the personnel department at the time. So that was my first inkling into human resources, personnel as we called it in those days. But I got there and I fell in love with it. I just fell in love with the world of people. And that was the end of law. Although I, there are times I think about it, I think I made a pretty decent lawyer as well. But I ended up... <laughs> I ended up in the place of people. But when I talk about the sowing uh, and careers, I look at the sowing in the place of being ready to let go of your expectations and the direction in which your life should go. You know, there are times I say that the, what the world teaches us and what the Bible teaches us can be at conflict. We are taught in the world to take the reins of your career and drive it and shape it. But I'm beginning to learn that the place of increase that pleases God is to let go of those reins, is to let go of those expectations so that God can sow and build the seed that gives him glory. Education is good, it's useful, it positions. But I think as we go on, you begin to realize that, I think Ecclesiastes uh, Solomon, I don't know who else could have told the story better. Because he tells us the story of how we can do all of these things, but that's not what brings increase. That's not what prospers. It is only God that prospers. So it means first and foremost, in the place of career, whether it is, Nine to five, whether it is your business, the first thing is that we're going to have to die to our own expectations. Because those expectations in many cases hinder your ability to discover and to learn. As I said, I had a journey mapped out for me. But I got thrust into something that was tangen tangential to that but basically God's redirection of what he wanted me to do. So it's a death to those expectations, but it's also a death to self and pride. The place of starting is the place of humility. And I'll speak about the circles as I, as I, as I discuss later, but you just have to be ready to do the work at that point. Whether it's mid-career, you've retired, you've gone to start a business, whatever it is, you have to accept that place of humility and service. As a youth copper, I told people I worked, I worked harder than staff. I worked weekends as a youth copper. I was hungry to work. And I always tell my boss as a youth copper, he's also still one of my closest friends and mentors still today. Because what he did at that time was, you know, he was also looking for somebody who could do the work. <laughs> and here I was as a greenhorn jackie, but I was ready to work. So I was not one of those youth coppers that would show up in the office and then go off and flange on. No, I was there Saturday, so if there was work to do, I did it. But it also meant that I began to learn new things that I wouldn't have known. It was during youth quite learned to swim because I needed to swim to enter a helicopter to be able to go to the field. So there were skills I picked up in that process. 
But one of the ways it paid off for me was that, and I'll, I'll talk about it in what I call your circle of service, was that as I served him, when they also started the recruitment process, he served me. Because he made sure all of his colleagues, whoever could teach her recruitment, come and coach her, whoever could do this, come and coach her, he made sure that he invested in my ability to cross that line. So the place of starting, the place of sowing, is a place of humility and service. Yes, you want to learn. Yes, you want to grow, but it's secondary. And I'll explain why I say it's secondary um, as we go on. So it was that bit about letting go of my expectations, the humility to learn and to serve. There are people who in the process of that starting point, who started work, all they did was carry handbag and make tea. Isn't it? They just were sending them on air and up and down. And you'll be asking yourself that, where is all of this errand going? But the key thing for me is, as you start that career journey, or as you move into this next phase, because I've had to redo the same thing again in starting my own business. After 30 years of corporate, make a transition to starting my own business, I can't come and start at the top. And I will just tell you one story yesterday. I can't come and start at the top. I have to learn again because the skills are different. The expectations are different. So that period of sowing is the period in which you die to your expectations and allow God to reveal the journey that is ahead to you. It's the place where you begin to humble yourself um, so that you can learn. And it's also the place where you begin to seek out who you are serving in that journey. It doesn't mean that you are a non-entity. It doesn't mean that you don't matter. But I think one of the things as um, children of God is, is knowing that you matter so much that you can afford to remove the toga of who you are. Because you, there's no point to prove anymore. And we saw our master do it. He who was king wash the feet of people because he had no point to prove. The next phase, and please, somebody will need to help me because I like to talk. And it's important that, uh, please, somebody should keep me on track um, with time, please. The next phase around that is the, is the phase of maturing, which I guess is a phase many of us are at. And that is a phase when you see the plants begin to grow. Usually what happens when a plant begins to grow? Ma? He birds. He birds first. What happens? So one is we've established the place of death. And something dies and life comes into it again. Isn't it? So you die, but life comes again. Because the source of life is not in the seed that has died. And then as that seed begins to board and begins to come to the surface, what begins to happen? What begins to happen as that seed dies and comes to the surface? Because, you see, the thing about uh, growth is that work starts on the first before the showing. The work starts on the before the showing. It is not seen, but the learning and expression starts on the. There are too many people, particularly in this age of social media, that want to start their growing in the surface. They are marketing and telling stories, but there is no foundation. So part of that process, when I say the sowing, the burden, is that the growing needs to start on that. You have to build skills. 
all this packaging and grammar is useful, but it's not important. The important thing is the skill that you have built. And as I mentioned, that skill is usually built in the place of tutelage under one person. You have to identify who is who you are learning from and what you are learning. And in those cases, it's okay for nobody to notice you. Actually, it's better for nobody to notice you. Because I always say people push themselves to a point of exposure that brings consequences. You want to quickly go and present to MD. <laughs> Meanwhile, only one question there, you begin to, you are stammering. The next day, when the man is going, they say, please, 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 don't bring me that guy. He doesn't seem to know what he's about. But we, at least from my HR profession, I see many people resist that period of hiding. That period of hiding and learning. I always talk about one person that I say he was my best and he was my worst boss. Rolled in one. He was my best boss because he invested in teaching me. I mean, besides this, my other boss, so this my other boss is all good. That one doesn't have good and bad. He's just a good guy. But I had this guy who, for the first time, you know, the, the, um, my boss I worked with during youth call, I did the work and I learned. This guy would teach me, like classroom, every day, 4 o'clock. I would come into his office, he would open a folder and actually teach me. The difference was I'd moved into a new role and I was like the youngest person in that role. So he, he really invested in teaching me properly. And the other reason I say was my best boss was if I ran into trouble with a client, he would always have my back. He would always have me. He, I can come back and then he says, Alero, next time don't do this, do it like this, do it like that. But in front of that client, he would always defend me. But the reason I also said he was my worst boss was because he was never present. So he gave me opportunity to grow, but in the normal parlance of discipline and character, that was not his purview at all. Which again was of benefit to me because um, I always remember there was a meeting that he was supposed to have with the lineman. Like I said, I was the youngest person in my own level. So in those days, senior managers don't even talk to people like me. But I had a one department that I was managing. So we had a meeting with the manager of that department. And it's my boss that was supposed to go for the meeting. Come day of the meeting, my boss was nowhere to be found. In those days, he would say whether glasses broke, something happened. Anyway, he was not available. So I go to the client's office, and the client was like, we have to cancel the meeting and he will reschedule for when my boss is around. So they rescheduled. The day of reschedule, in all day. So at that point, the manager decided that if he was going to get anything done, he had better work with this small girl because this person is waiting for, is never going to show. And that was how I took the space and myself and this uh, manager started to work together another very profitable relationship over the years. So that piece of, because it is the preparation that allows you to take opportunity when it comes. So what he had done in the back end meant that when he was absent, I was able to step into that space as was, um, as was required. But the other bit I wanted to mention is, as you grow beneath, you begin to grow above. You begin to grow above. And as you grow above, the usual things that begin to happen in that place is that the gardener starts to inspect. He's checking. Is this thing growing? He's weeding. He's ensuring that you have the right nourishment is ensuring you have the right exposure. And it's exactly the same thing in the place of work. There are things that in the early days, you know, there, Madam Cole talked earlier about when you choose to stay. Many times in the course of careers, people choose to leave. 
or you'll be tempted to want to leave, whether it's business or whether it's work, because there's a point where it gets tough. Usually the point where the checking begins to happen. When people are beginning to point fingers at the quality of the work that you're doing. When assessments are being set. When conversations around your future are being had. It gets tough. And part of the skills, the understanding we need to have that it is a necessary process. Because without feedback, without those assessments, what happens? Both the tree and the weed are competing for nutrition. So it's important that that is happening so that the weed, the things, the behaviors that are not profitable are being removed. And we have to give room in the place of work for that to happen. Supervisors, managers are being placed over us, particularly to perform that process of weeding and nurturing that allows us to grow. But it also means that you have a responsibility in that process. One is the responsibility of what you do with the feedback that you are receiving. Whether you're going to take it to grow or you're just going to turn it to corridor gossip and grumbling. The other responsibility you have is the responsibility to ask for the right nourishment. As you learn and as you invest in your training opportunities that you think you should be going on, assignments that you think you should be part of, in a bid to help you grow. It is your responsibility to put voice to it. No can do that. Line managers, in my days, the line manager and organizations decided the life of employees, right? We told people what to do. After now, you move into this job, you move into that job. And there were clear paths in the organization I worked, clear paths as to what you needed to do. But all of that is changing now because people need to get more in that driving seat. There's a lot of information available online, courses and all of that that you can do by yourself that allows you to be empowered to have those conversations. So that process is long. You see, the, when something is under the earth, it takes a bit of time. But when it starts to grow visibly, it takes a long time for it to mature into a tree. And that means that the key skill we need in that space is the patience to let that maturing process happen. Opportunities will come, exposures will come, but we need to give it room to mold us. Unlike... Um, Sister Iko, I took that overseas assignment. But I think, again, is understanding the cycles of life. Because the time it happened for me was actually early in my career. I think it was maybe around my eighth. I went to 19. So about my eighth year into my career. I, actually, I hadn't married. I married for another problem. Because... <laughs> Now, it was a case of the first four years of my marriage we were apart. Back and my dad saying, now you are getting married. And I was like, getting married after two children. He says, because it is only now that you people are living together. Marriage really is. But like I said, in those days, it was almost like a given. If you were going to go this far, you had to do it. So I basically followed the path of for me. With what I know now, maybe my choices would have been different. Maybe I would have reined in more control over that process. Because the second time I had to go, I went first four years, came back four years, and went again for two years. But the second time I was going, I was in the driving seat. I actually was uh, in control of that process and the outcome. It was a short process is part of the development. Everything comes with pain. 
There's a cost to every decision. So that process of considering what my options are, what is the cost of this decision that I'm about to make? Why, as women, prayer cannot be far from you. It cannot be far from you because all of these conversations are not, are not rational conversations. You will see two people make the same choice and one person prospers and for the other one is damnation. Why? Because what God had in mind for each and every one of us is distinct and is unique. So you cannot be far from the place of prayer. But thirdly, I'll just talk about, so that season is a long one. We have to be ready. It's a long one. And then you begin to board, the branches are coming through. Bit by bit, things are beginning to happen. But the third phase is that after a tree has matured, what do you want to do? You want to harvest it. You want to harvest it. They plot. It means that when you mature, you must be in a position that you are pouring into the lives of others. A position where you are replicating yourself in the workplace. My question is, are you replicatable? I know that for a fact, I mean, one of the things that sent me um, when the Lord laid the vision for women at work in my heart was at the point at which I was leaving corporate. You know, after 30 years, I looked back and I was like, Alero, you did too many things wrong. There were decisions I could have done made very differently because I made the work about me, not about my savior. I made it about my appearance, I made it about my professionalism, I made it about my name and I forgot the name of the one that I was there to bear. And so I believe that at the end of the day, and that harvest is not when you retire. Because as what happens, as the tree buds, you harvest and then what does? It grows again. So it is recognizing early on that in the place of work, the identity we carry and the fruit we must bear is the fruit that glorifies God. So it can't be about us. We can't afford to get into the quarrels for promotion, for salary increase. It can't be about that. Because the God who, he says promotion comes from where? It comes neither from this, but from above. It's God that promotes. It's God that promotes. The reality is that from a nature point of view, the most serious conversations about you are not had with you. They are conversations that people have when you are not there. So let's not preoccupy ourselves with the things that we can't control. But the fruit that we bear must be fruit that will abide. How do people feel when we come into the room? And particularly as women, in the early days, I said the place of work was male. The DNA of work was male. The way decisions are made, the organization, everything was masculine. But in the world of today, we are beginning to see that what makes organizations thrive is also bringing in what the traditional feminine qualities, the humaneness, the compassion, 
the care for people, care for environment, the ability to nurture. So it means that when we come into the place of work, we must bear that fruit. I think we spoke earlier about how in the course of work, we become too many different things. You are going and coming, you don't even know which one. Many of us, when we get home, forget to remove the office or gatoga. And then you come in again, you are saying, please help me pass that. And your husband is looking at you, who, are, who is passing it? Who are you talking to? But we must learn to be consistent. We must learn that our primary identity is in Christ. Whether they promote you or not is secondary. Because in his own time, he has a way of making all things work together for good. In his own time. So I would like to talk about the cycles that you now need to support you on that journey. And I'll talk about four key cycles. So we've talked about the phase of life, the point at which you choose to die, the sowing um, season, when you're growing and when you mature. But in that period, there are four cycles I would like to talk about. The first cycle is your service cycle. Anybody that will grow in business or in career must be providing one service. So if, you are in an, if you're working in an organization, you have to ask yourself, what is the service I'm providing in this organization and to who? I always tease that there are many people who come to work, they are very busy. Very busy doing meaningless work. Work that is... In many cases, is actually taking energy out of the organization. You have to be clear what is your service cycle. Who am I serving? One of the, in that service cycle, one of the people that must be there is who is your boss. Your boss is not the one you contend with. Your boss is the person you choose to serve. Your position is to make your boss look good. When he looks good, then he remembers to make you look good. I think I've given you that example. The other thing you need to look is, where are the, in that space, who are the people that need my help? Who am I mentoring? Who am I supporting? Who is my life serving? And those are relationships you must identify and actively cultivate. The second cycle I'll talk about is your learning cycle. I think everybody that has talked earlier talked about the issue of learning. Proverbs 18.15 says, An intelligent heart acquires knowledge, and the heir of the wise seeks knowledge. There is no end to learning. There is no end to learning. When, because every time you are a master at something, you are a novice at something else. And the transition and speed with which the world is going means that the skills and expertise of yesterday are totally irrelevant in today. And they, the speed is only increasing. Because with AI, the speed is on steroids. So you must position yourself to learn. Who, who is in your learning cycle? Who are the people supporting your learning? Regardless of how big you are, there must be a mentor or a coach in your cycle. There must be somebody that is providing you that cover and direction. The difference between a mentor and a coach is that usually a mentor is somebody who has walked your path, right? A coach, in many cases, doesn't need to have walked your path, but must have the ability to ask you the most important questions. The questions that challenge the frontiers of your learning. The other thing I would say about that is even in that cycle of um, your line, learning cycle, one of the things I have is what I call a reverse mentor. Because usually when you say mentors, they are older, they know. I also have young people in my cycle. 
Because there are things they know I will not know. And I need to know. So there's a young lady, Chica, I always call she's my mentor. Because when it's time to do slide and the whole thing is dabaruin, I know that there's somebody that can tell me, arrange it like this, arrange it like this, and it will work. So again, the issue of learn, learning is not a matter of age. It's not a matter of age. My current supervisor in school now, she's 40 years old. So I will now say because she's 40, I will not humble myself to bring my submission as at when due. <laughs> it, it, it's irrelevant. So let's be active in cultivating that, that circle around us. And it's also your peers. Because the other story that came to my mind is one of the reasons why the church could rise after the passing of the master was because there was a group that learned together under him. The disciples bonded in their learning. So that when Jesus was not there, all of those experiences helped them to go forward as one. So you have your above, you have your lateral, and you must have people behind you that you're learning from as well. For some of us, it could be our children. The third circle I would like to talk about is your encouragement cycle. As I said, it gets tough. And there must be people in the, around you that are able to encourage you on that journey when things get tough. Um, we talk about women's networks in organizations. In many cases, those women's networks, some function sometimes as encouragement circles. Because what, why is someone able to encourage you? In many cases, they believe in you and they've also had the experience that you are going through. And there's a common understanding of the pain that you might be, that you might be experiencing. So finding people that you can count on for encouragement. But you know what is the key to being, to having encouragement partners? Is that you are also an encourager. Because the issue of encouragement has to be mutual. So I'm there for you, you're there for me. And the scripture is also so clear about why this is important. Because it tells us that on the journey, it is guaranteed that we fall sometimes. And that is why scripture says, don't journey alone. The journey of life, the journey of career is not for you alone. There must be people around you available to encourage you when the going gets tough. And there must be people around you that you are also encouraging when the going gets tough. I think some of the things that helped me along the way was I, I ended up spending the bulk of my career in the organization I did youth call with. So there were people I grew up with. And you know the truth was I, I was in that organization for about 25 years before I went into my next organization. And it was when I went into my next organization I knew the value of that encouragement. Because they saw me as a child, basically they saw me grow up. They believed in the journey that I was on. And now I was in a new organization, I didn't have that support network because I also came in at the top of my, of my discipline. There were times I sat in that office and I was crying. There was nobody to talk to. There was nobody to talk to. People expected you to come out with decisions. I couldn't expose my vulnerability of I'm struggling with this. So in many cases, I had to catapult back to those same people. 
to say, see what I'm going through, see the experience that I'm having, and to share. And I must say that one of them, there was a season towards the end. I had a very difficult season. I went through a very dark season that I'd never gone through in all my 30 years. But it took only the word. So I was telling one of my mentors from my previous organization that, can you believe it? They said, I did A, B, C, D. And his only word was, that, don't they know you? You know, that word alone gave me so much comfort. That in the midst of everything else, there's still somebody that believes in me. So you must have that cycle that encourages you. And I think the scripture I was going to hold on to there was Hebrews 10, um, 24 to 25. It says, and let us consider how we may spur one another unto love and good deeds, not giving up on meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. You can't be too busy that you don't have time for those relationships. So whether it's your at home, whether it's your spouse, whether it's you must have time to nurture those encouraging relationships. And the last cycle I want to talk about is your accountability cycle. You must ensure that you deliberately surround yourself with people that will ask you the tough questions. People that will hold your feet to fire. You see, the human nature, the, our wiring, this body likes comfort. The minute it, it is not under, is not guarded, it will relax. It will relax. So it is important that you have people around you that are helping to hold you up. There are plans that people make concerning their self-development journeys, whether it's a course or a program. I have some friends who will be telling every year the thing is entering plan, and every year it is, it is not done. The next year again, we put it. That is like my weight loss journey. We begin in January. By February, the thing is shaky. But you mo if you're going to be the best version of yourself, there has to be tension. So let's be careful that we are not surrounding ourselves with people that are saying, Alero, you are good enough. Ah, you are fine, you are fine. Mm -mm. It's knowing that there's something inside that I'm capable of doing, but it comes from the place of tension. And that means that there are seasons that there are people holding my feet to that fire. That by hook or by crook, Alero, you will finish this thing. I've been on a journey for four years back to school and I can't imagine the number of times I want to give up. And this last week was one of those seasons because I went to school in January for one of those conferences and I realized that I was so out of it, I was so behind on everything. I kept asking myself, that, who sent you this work? Who? But as I kept saying it, this is my first God that when I come back, I say, he said, Alera, is it going? He said, stop. He said, you will finish it. Whether you like it or not, this thing, you will finish it. And because I'd put it out, it's difficult for me to retreat. Because there are people asking me every minute, how is that thing going? And you have to finish it. Even when I've stopped believing in myself, And, you know, you need people that will hold you to account. You see, the journey of life and the journey of careers, like I said, career is just a part of it. But the most important thing is that when we see our master, we have to come empty. We have to have fulfilled his call and his purpose. And there's just some ingredients that are necessary for that to happen. The people you surround yourself with matter. If it is a wedding to Aria, to Aria, Aria, to Aria, I'm sorry. 
Because all of those things take time. Before you know what's happening, days are gone. Social media, on a daily basis, hours are being leaked. So the life that will prosper in the place of work or in general has to be a life that is lived intentionally. When I spoke earlier about letting go of expectations and all of that, it's, not, it's an intentional choice that you are making. Not because you are a nobody, but because you know that the path up is to go down. And you are ready to make that sacrifice for that season. Organizations will look out for themselves. They will do what is best for themselves. So there is only God on your side. So you must ensure that you align with his own plan and his agenda for that season. So if your face is down at any point in time, is your face down at the master's feet to get the instruction for how you will operate in the place of work? I, I, you know, I'm just so amazed at how much more God can do with our careers. You know, your office is your pulpit. Everyone who comes into Christ is a minister. It's just that the location of ministry is different. So once you recognize that that office is your place of ministry to God, the attitude changes. I was listening to one guy yesterday. He was talking, was it yesterday or even today? On Instagram. And he was talking about how he was working and God told him, I mean, he was making enough to get by. So he works six days a week. Did you what? He works only one day a week now. And he makes more money in one day than he did when he was working seven days. Is this same Ecclesiastes that tells us that he, to work, it is God that gives pleasure out of work. So when we have the perspective right, that this work is not an end in itself. The ability to enjoy the fruit of your labor is only God that gives. And I've seen too many. I mean, we all just experienced one recently that reminds us ever so clearly that it is only God that is our source. So I don't want us to be hung up about, hung up about careers. I want us to lay it at the master's feet and ask him to use it. His only desire is that we bear fruit. So whatever needs to die, should die. Whatever needs to be developed, should develop. Whatever needs to be weeded, let's give him permission to weed it. So that the fruit that we bring will be one that will abide. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. Just clap one more time. I'm so grateful to God that he would, uh, you know, he would just tell you something in the moment and you will follow through. How many of us understand that this has been one really powerful sister power gathering? And Eric, you just sent me a message about plantain and yam. And I just realized, oh my God, why would, would she not be on the lineup? Just so that we can come and um, learn these things and really learn them. And learn them from people who've been there, done that. Bought the t-shirt, changing the style of the t-shirt. That's what's happening here. And I hope you're not sitting there thinking, well, they're talking to the people who still have some vibrance in them. You will make a major mistake if you take a look at it like that. 
If you have questions, please put, begin to put your questions together. I do not have a lot, a lot of time to stay here and say anything. But before we go into my saying anything at all, Eniola, please, can you project for me? I want to show you where we're going. As many of you would know, Sister Pa is now, we now have regional, um, regional um, um, coordinators, which means that Sister Pa is now recognized regionally, even though we're a global body. So we have Sister Power Canada, we have Sister Power the United Kingdom, we have Sister Power the US, we have, and you this is not good enough for me. We have Sister Power, um, focus on one and make it expand, please, the t-shirt itself. We have Sister Power Inugu, we have Sister Power Abuja, and so we have those, and we, or more we come up as the Lord enables and helps us in the course of this year and beyond. But to that end, we have found a need to have something that um, distinguishes us and yet unifies us. So one of the things we're doing is this T-shirt. And Yola, God will deliver you from you. I don't, I don't like what I'm seeing, so I can't even... I can't even just really celebrate this beautiful design that we did. I think that you, you ought to give me a black background for this thing to make sense. But look at this. This is, this is the front of our T-shirt. This is the front of our T-shirt. We want something really nice, something really colorful. And yes, that's the front of, that's another design. So we'll have both designs. And yes, thank you. Ah, everybody is now just looking at me like it doesn't matter. It matters to me. So this is you. This is me. And at the back of the t-shirt, we just have the same inscription. Together, we are more. Together, we are more. And on the sleeve, you have the, if you are Sister Power UK, you have Sister Power UK, Sister Power Canada, Sister Pa US and wherever you are. We have Lagos in Nigeria. We actually have Lagos. We have Abuja and we have um, Enugu right now. So, Portacot, well, Portacot, when they call me, we'll go. You know, but the point is that we are going global. And um, as the Lord helps us, we'll continue to expand. Hallelujah. So, um, again, when the, um, for I start, at least for those of us in Nigeria, we're going to print in Nigeria. We're going to get all of it done in Nigeria, which means when we're ready, you can pick up your copy. But before, um, earlier on, I had spoken about membership dues, and our chairman of the board has had to step out to rush to somewhere else where she, was. she had a function and she had a role. But we, in the regions, you would have heard from your coordinators that we are holding, it's only Lagos coordinator. I don't know whether you're talking to your people, Lagos coordinator. Where is she? Uh, but the point is that um, Susan Power is transitioning. If you want to get the more out of us, we're transitioning to membership dues because we all know that this thing run, these things run by money, right? And Star Power, for instance, we can't gather and know it. It looks like an abomination. We, and the will not like the fact that we eat a lot, but we have to eat, yes. So, uh, <laughs> but, so all of those things cost money. And for the many years that Sister Pa is run, it's just run on, you know, personal contributions and personal donations. But that needs to change because we want people to take part ownership of what we are doing. So we have put the... Um, the dues, membership dues per person. If you want to be a card carrying member of Sister Power you, at 5,000 Naira per month, that's the minimum, right? Yes, we're not even expensive like that. We're cheapskate. You can see it, but 5,000 Naira. You can do more, but 5,000 is the base and 20K is the limit. You can still do more, but we will not fall beyond, below 5,000 Naira in Jesus' name monthly and you can pay all at once you can pay monthly whatever you want to do your coordinators will be reaching out to you but the reason is simply simply because we want to serve you more we want to be able to open our learning hubs 
We want to be able to second wind is just one of the things. We want to have premarital um, departments, counseling departments or preparatory departments. And we're going to be bringing facilitators who are professionals in those fields. We's not, we're not doing all of this. If we have capable hands in-house, we would definitely use them. But if we don't, then it means that we're going to have to contract people and then you, you know, ask people to come. And all of that costs money. For more details for that will come as we go on. Hallelujah. So now I'm going to go and just share with you what the Lord asked me to share. And I promise you, I'll do my best to be um, fast. There is a suitcase in that corner. Somebody please open it and give me everything that is inside that suitcase. Um, the Lord said that you have to see it to understand it. And so I'm going to, we're going to just do this. Because when I, I was thinking, you know now, I'm a teacher. You know that, right? By the grace and mercy of God, I'm a teacher and I'm good at it. And um, I've been taught just the same way they told you, if you want to do this, you have to be a celebrity by force. I've been taught that humility is not a good trait. They say, oh, I'm not anything. No, I'm a good teacher. I promise you I am. Praise Jesus. So I'm owning it. And if you're upset, I'm sorry, but um, I am a good teacher. Let me say it one more time. <laughs> so I was looking for all this really, and I like to teach off, left of feed. I, had, I like to teach and you'll be like, oh, wow, I didn't see that. So that was, I had gotten into that gear again. I was like, ah, no, when I finish this, so everybody will know that my brain works. But the Lord said there was no point. Apparently, because three brilliant women were going to come and cover all of that basis. All of that basis. And um, I don't think you needed another scripture thrown, into, thrown in your face for you to see what the Lord is talking about today. Circles and cycles. How many of us have ever, in an, in an, in an African or in Nigerian market, experienced a woman suddenly giving birth? How many of us have ever experienced it? You've never experienced it before. It's something beautiful to behold. The moment the woman goes into labor and another woman discovers or rec recognizes or realizes that she's in labor, this is what we do. We pull out our wrappers. So I need volunteers, please. Because if we're talking about circles and we're talking about cycles, you need to see it. And I want you to, this is your wrapper. Each person, this is how the... Shaws in my house. Don't let one go missing. No. <laughs> yes. These are all your rappers. I want more people. I brought enough. These are all your rappers. Now, what happens is if you know that that's why we shouldn't, we should never be overly cosmopolitan to forget that our culture matters. Now, you know, African women or Nigerian women, no matter what you wear, you wear a slip under. No matter what you wear, you wear a slip under. And it is in experiencing this, seeing it happen, that I realize why they always have a slip under. Because when they have to cover their sisters, they don't have to go naked. Somebody will hear that maybe next year. I said when you have to cover your sister and be in their circle in that moment, what you'll find is you are not naked. Because what the word is to told us, or is um, the way the word wants us to believe, or what the word wants us to believe is that, Mommy Mo, if you cover me, you'll be naked. And so we are afraid of each other. We are suspicious of each other. We do want to be those people who just because they want to be there for their sister, they are, ex they are exposed. Now here's what I saw when I saw this thing a long time ago in Edo State. You will have to tie one onto the other. That's what I saw. That was the, the way they did it. Yes, they just tied it. No, the edges. In the edges, because remember, you are wearing your waist slips, so you have pulled out your wrapper. And in those, in those states, especially the women tied two wrappers as one. So when they pulled the first one, they still had a wrapper under. And those who were wearing buba and wrappers, even those who were wearing skirts and a blouse, still had a wrapper that they could run to their stall to pick. And this is what they do. So who is the woman giving birth today? The woman giving birth is in the middle. Who wants to be the one that is bringing forth today? Somebody needs to come quickly. I need a volunteer. She's the one bringing forth. This is what happens. And there are midwives, not trained, but experienced. 
Ah, you don't lie down, self. <laughs> this guy will not kill you. <laughs> but do you know what happens? Once they notice the woman is about to give birth, where are the midwives? There will be at least two women who have gone through this, and from their own experience, they can coach another woman to bring forth. I want the midwives in the middle. The midwives come in the middle, and the woman in the middle is carrying precious life. And what she really wants to do, and all of us need for her to do, is that we want her to bring forth. And we, want, we are invested in both the, the life of the baby and the life of the mother. And yet there are people all over the place. The market is still going on. That's the thing I like about this thing. The moment they notice that a woman is about to give birth, this is what happens. They tie it all together and all of a sudden there is covering for a woman because we know that for life to come forth, something has to die. And that means that also people, you know, there's a, a level of vulnerability and nakedness that is required for another woman to bring forth life. Hallelujah. Now look at the look at the midwife in the middle she's not claiming to be anything she's talking she's oblivious of all the drama that is happening around here what's she doing she's speaking to the one who is about to bring forth hallelujah but you see the, the women that for me you know i look at them and i'm like wow do you know what they do because all these women left their stalls and their businesses to come there are other people who quickly go back there and they are watching the business the market is still going on people are still selling people People are still buying, but someone is bringing forth. We have heard from our facilitators or ministers today that life does not stop simply because something happened to one of us. Life, we continue to go on. And in the process of life is going on, Stalera talked about transitions. Stalera, do you know what I have learned about transitions? The reason why we fear transitions is because it's both an ending and a beginning. Transitions are both endings and their beginnings. And so, if all you can see a transition to be is an ending, you will lose your mind. And if all you can see a transition to be is a beginning, you would be unsure of yourself. You will lose confidence. And so, there is there's a transition obviously happening here. But there is a woman in the middle who is telling the other woman, this is what I want you to do. Don't, don't, don't push yet. All I need you to do is breathe. There are women all around running helter skelter. Do you know that as this is going on and the other women have gone to their stores to go and watch their, their store and their neighbor's store, do you know what is happening? There are women whose homes are not far from here. Two of them have rushed to go and boil water and bring it. Every time someone says to you that your sister cannot cover you, I want this picture to never leave your mind. That's how it happens. And so all of a sudden, we can hear the cry of the baby. Do you know what happens? All the other women, they are still at their stores. They are still selling, uh, they, are, they begin to scream. There is, a, there is a jubilation. And the next thing, there is a fragrance in the air. Because where you are standing, somebody comes and pours powder on you. And pours powder on the earth. Why? Because a life has come. But everybody thinks that it's the woman lying down that brought forth the baby. But it took all of us. Because where she went into labor and perhaps she couldn't move anymore, if she was left alone, she'll probably die and the baby would die. We need each other. It is the point of cycles and it's the point of circles. Your cycles suggest that there was a day she probably was not pregnant. This woman might have been someone who had had to wait for a couple of years before she can get pregnant. That was a cycle in her life. And what I want to encourage all of us, you know, Mom, if most said, do a list, who am I? When not only, I'm not only asking you to do a list of who you are, I'm also going to ask you to do a list of the things you do and in what cycles you do them. I had, to, I had come to find out that the big things in my life happen every five years. At the end of every five years, I have to, you know, embrace the learning circle all over again. And then I had to. I know that I'm in a transition. Something will die, something will be birthed. And knowing that now, by the time I get to my third and half year, I get myself in position and I'm planning for my next, one, the rest of my one and a half years. Just like Auntie IQ at 55 asked herself, so after this, what next? 
And she said, okay, I am going to have to learn this. And she had to be learning from her children. And how many, I don't know whether you have been to her blog before. She has one of the best food photography blogs I know. I haven't seen anyone do justice to food in how the plate, you know, the food is plated in the photography itself. I remember there was a day she was saying us that her son said to her mommy, well, can't you see that this one is... Uh, sorry, sir, because what else will you do now? Is your teacher at that point? But the point I'm making is that when your cycles change, when your seasons begin to change, we talked about learning, we talked about encouragement, we talked about accountability, all of those things, you must build them in. But the focus I want you to see is that what we are looking for is that this baby will come forth, we will not lose the baby, and we will not lose the mother. Hallelujah. Is someone with me so far? Every time, I, when I experienced this thing, it was in the market. When I experienced it, you know, the smell of the powder, midnight, midnight something. Yes, like this, blue like this. But I remember midnight, that's the name of the powder. That midnight rose, right? The scent of the fragrance of that powder stayed with me for days. And they didn't even put it on me because I wasn't part of them. But it stayed with me for days because I could never forget what profound togetherness I saw. And the funny thing is that maybe save for those whose stores were close to each other. These women didn't know each other until someone who came in their midst maybe to buy rice or something went into labor. The synergy, the seamlessness, the no, uh, there were people who had to tie their wrappers with each other that possibly were not talking to each other. But now there was a project at hand, and what mattered was that that project had to succeed. Woman, you are not a one, uh, you are not uh, um, your own project. You are not your own project. You are a project for everybody that the Lord will give you the opportunity to come around. But how you respond, how you do with them, how you, if you become the encourager, uh, Ijama, you're changing many things on that screen. What you, what, how you do with each other would determine whether you, they, when the day comes, someone will be standing there to cover you. Does this make sense? When the Lord, two things the Lord taught me this morning, predictive programming, and then this, and he reminded me, he said, do you remember when you saw this happen? And I said, yes. But do you know that whatever Stajimoka is saying to Rachel, <coughs> Rachel cannot say to Stajimoka, I don't know you. So I'm not going to believe what you are telling me. Rachel ha if Rachel ventured to say to Stajimoke, I don't trust what you are saying to me, we'll have casualties and victims. And Stajimoke, even though she's kneeling there, the thing I saw that day, I wish if I were an artist who could paint, I'd like to paint the scene. I saw people who were focused. The ones who were holding the, bar, the, the cloth <coughs> were not tired. They held onto this cloth. I didn't see them saying, ah, Chikudi, somebody is going to come in to buy snail. Quickly help me hold it. No, ma'am, thank you. I th I'm, I'm good. But do you know, Mommy Mo, they did not allow any man come near them. Because if a man was coming, yes, they just, ah, get, oh, 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 God, come over here. No, come here. I know we now live in Lagos. I know. None of us wants to give, a, give birth in the market. But maybe it will be a great thing if we begin to give birth in the market again. And the point I'm making is that it's not so much about, oh yes, you are truly bringing forth in the marketplace. To recognize that people don't even need to have a doctorate degree to have, or have a, become, be medical doctors in that, you know how many of them, none of them is a medical doctor, right? And yet, they will bring the baby out. They will clamp the cord. They will cut it. They will wrap the woman up. They will take the placenta. And then they will now ask questions. Where your house? There are many women in the Bible I can talk to you about. But I choose to talk to you about Ruth and Naomi. 
If there was anything close to this that I saw, it was that. Where two women in different seasons or cycles of their life found common ground in the fact that they both lost husbands. And they decided, because it was intentional, Ruth decided, I'm going with Naomi. Naomi decided, if she comes with me, I will be there for her. And I don't know whether you've read your Bible because Mommy Mo just told us today to be familiar with her Bible. Maybe you need to go home and be familiar with your Bible. But what I do remember in that account is that when you go to, um, I believe it's Matthew chapter 2 or so, or Matthew chapter 1, and you look out for the genealogy of Jesus Christ, you will find Ruth. What you may not remember is that Ruth is not Jewish. Ruth is a Moabite, which meant that when it comes to tribe and many things, she did not qualify. But because another woman chose to stand with her and decided that we will push you no matter what, she told her what to do with Boaz, and she did it. Not once did I hear Ruth push back and say, Ah, Naomi, you don't like me. And that's how we arrive here today. When Alera was talking, I have had to stand on the shoulders of many women. And I'm still standing on the shoulders of many women. I wouldn't be here today. You see, when God told me to do the well, Mommy Mo, I haven't seen you in a long time, so we've not swapped uh, war stories. I couldn't tell any man. I couldn't even tell my husband. You know why? Because this is an ambition that they've told us is not an ambition a woman should have. Here it fell on me, not by ambition, but by mantle. But the pre-programming and conditioning would not let me dare to share with a man until I shared with my sisters. And they said to me, be demi no be you, you can do it. None of them attends the well today. But every time I want to give up, I remember that when I shared the vision, they saw it. What I do know as a matter of fact is that if also when I shared it, they didn't see it, they would have killed it. They would have told me, nah, this one will not work. I keep telling us that if you don't have that cycle, Side, you know, circle of people, sorry. If you don't have the circle of people, you are lost. But it takes trusting. It takes being vulnerable. It takes agreeing for someone you've never seen before to lift your wrapper simply because they can tell that what's happening with you is you are bringing forth a baby. It takes people who in the moment where all you can be is naked, we pull their own wrappers and be in semi-naked conditions to cover you. It takes people who run to their houses and do what? They boil water and they bring it. It takes people who well watch over their, the other uh, business stores so that nobody loses money simply because one of us is having a child. When they say it takes a village, it truly takes a village. When they said it takes a village, it truly takes a village. This is what I never want you to forget. Thank you, ladies. God bless you. If you forget this, you will do anyhow. If you do anyhow, you will see anyhow. The key is who you want others to be to you is who you must be to them. When I called on my sisters, my big sisters to come today, none of them said to me, eh, my fee is five million naira. They, none of them even said, not one of them said to me, let me go and think about it and come back. It was a calendar issue. The moment the calendar was open, all three of them said yes. How exactly do you think I would have been able to do these three things and then do this? 
I wouldn't. I wouldn't. None of us knows what that baby is going to grow up to become. That baby may, baby may be told, oh, you were born in the market. That baby may never know the people who shielded his mom for him, him or her to be born. But that baby, even if that baby went on to become the president of the Federal Republic, all of those women, plus the ones who just jubilated with great joy, and, you know, all of them contributed to who that child has become. You need to get that. That is not until they write your name beside someone's name that you have contributed. I've done this work for a number of years. And one of the things we see the most is that people don't say thank you. One of the things we see the most is that people take you for granted. One of the things you see the most is no matter what you poured into people, when they are telling their stories, it's convenient for them to forget you existed. You know, and I got to a point and I said to myself, there's no point. And I would tell them, I say, you don't ever need to mention my name, but heaven knows my name. And you see, not because I'm trying to hold you to ransom or to hold your jugular. Even if you don't mention my name, in the records of heaven, your story is not complete if my name is not mentioned. I'm not living for you. I'm living for the one that sent me. Because this needs to be validated. This need for everybody to say, oh, it's you, has made us stop being cover us for other people. It's made us say, no, they don't say thank you, so I will no longer do it again. What do you want more? The thank you of Ma or the applause of heaven? That's our journey. It's why sister power is I always will know someone who knows someone who knows someone. By the time I ask four people and they ask eight people, I'm where I'm supposed to be. But do you know what I've even found? It's just three degrees. Scientifically, it's three degrees to where you need to go. If I ask one person, that person just needs to ask another person. That other person, the, who the last person they ask, always has what you need. That's where we are. Just the same way Naomi, went, because of Naomi, um, because of Ruth, Naomi felt restored. And because of Naomi, Ruth stood a chance in the history of Israel. The person seated next to you may be your key to the next. The first woman you meet in church tomorrow may be the key to your next. The woman that you, when you are walking in your estate, you actually walk past and you give the ones over, may be the key to your nest. Next time you see her, good morning and a smile is necessary. I don't want you to forget we are bringing forth life. And for that reason, no woman should be left behind. Thank you so much. God bless you. Do we have questions? <coughs> Do we have questions, please? If you have them written down, let's see them. If you don't have them written down and you want to ask the question, we'll give you the microphone. No questions. All of us were bringing forth the baby. We did not write our questions. We don't have questions. Is that even possible? Yes, please. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. <laughs> It's interesting that, um, you know, what you just said resonates with me. Auntie Kwa is here, and um, she has been a pillar 
mm. you know, in, in, in helping me. I'll, I'll just tell a short story. I was about to write a book, and it's a cookbook, and um, I never knew her before. So I just entered her DM and said to her, I need you to write my foreword. And um, you may not know me, but if you don't listen to me, then I will go and speak to people who know you and you'll be forced to write it. <laughs> so, so longer and short, she wrote my foreword and my book came out. Interestingly, like, like we all know, her name was not on the flyer initially, so I didn't know she was going to be. I was battling with, I, I just attend um, uh, Commanding Your Morning in the mornings, and she was the one that invited me. She kept sending me messages, messages, so I had to listen. And, um, Sorry, we can be persistent like that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's because we wanted you to get something. <laughs> so I, I, I had, I was battling with, should I go? Shouldn't I go? Should I go? Shouldn't I go? And then I saw Mommy Mo's mm -hmm. um, picture. Mm -hmm. She doesn't know me, but we see each other every morning when we walk. Oh, well, wow. most mornings okay. when we walk. Initially, mm -hmm. that's me, ma. Wow. <laughs> 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 so uh, this rapper thing, you know, mm. of holding one another, it, mm. it's real. Mm. It's real to me. Mm. I also want to say something. You made a comment about, you know, whether people say thank you or they don't mm. say thank mm. you. You know, I, I have a problem with that. You okay. know, Pe people just should say thank you. They should say thank you. Yeah, but we cannot legislate their bad behavior. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. You know, but, but this, this, this is what I say, even to my husband, even to... to it's it's not to you know, I know celebrate very, negatively yes, yes. you know but I'm like if I give you something or I do something for say you, thank you please say now. thank you that, that's all you have to say mm. thank you mm -hmm. so people get entitled mm -hmm. with, by wrong behavior mm -hmm. and I just feel that maybe sometimes we need to let them know that you know you know you really should say thank you for this <laughs> not by force but, but i think yes. that it's something i agree that, with yeah. you but i i just i have just gotten to the point that i said to myself can i spend one more minute of my energy on your bad behavior Absolutely. so if you won't say thank you by all means just be going but the point is and and that just helps us not to get into the place where disappointment will make us stop so if you know that whether they applaud you or they say thank you or not, heaven will. It just helps you recalibrate because the next person will not be them. The next person may not act like them so that we don't shut them out. That's why for me, I had to get there because that I, I used to say, come back, can't you say thank you? <laughs> then I started realizing that it was, it, 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 sometimes it would look like you are petty. So after I said, don't say thank you, just be going. It is fine. God will help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. And um, Ijeoma, please attend to Sister Ijeomoke before she leaves. Yes, ma'am, there's someone out there. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, ma. Yeah, my name is Sobioma Agosim. Yes, good God bless you, ma. I'm actually glad to be here. I, I saw the flyer. Mm. Me, by the way, I'm meeting you for the first time. <laughs> Mommy Mo. <laughs> you know, I, I've been following you. Yes, many years. Been, yes, ma. Yes. Mm. But then um, as the last speaker was talking, mm. you know, I was, I, I've gotten to a point, you know, you've done some things. And this morning as I was coming, I was really in tears. Mm. Because it was like, I was feeling lonely. Hmm. I, I felt like, you know, people tell you you're doing well, but there's even nobody to talk to. Where are her rapper sisters? You know, and... So her rapper was, sisters need to get up now. As she was talking, I was even shedding tears mm -hmm. more, you know. So I, I really thank God for bringing me here. Mm. At times you do the work and mm. you can't even talk to anyone. Mm. So I, I really appreciate everything that have happened here and then... Um, Okay. I'm grateful that I'm here. Praise. I'm grateful you are here. And um, you can lean on any one of us. God bless you. Never again will you be lonely in Jesus' Amen. name. Because we're here, isn't it? Praise God. Anyone else? Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Questions? Question? No. They will not ask now. Tomorrow morning, now you not let me sleep. It's Sunday. Oh. I don't answer question on Sunday. Okay, if you don't have questions, let's hear your takeaways. Your food has been pre-packed, and so you take your food away. We are grateful that you could come, but please don't leave. Start Salvioma, please don't leave. I want to hug you. Please. Yes. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Mads. Good afternoon. My name is Teisola Young. <clears throat> well, I don't have a question because I'm already blessed. It was, it was like a lot of questions in my heart for some years, for some months, which were all met by our great facilitators from the first to the second and to the third months. You... You did a fantastic job. And you now I've been asking God, I've always lived in fear. I actually discovered I was fair recently with our pastor, Pidemi. He helped me discover that. From fear, from the place of family, you know, from because of my hope group bringing and uh, things where I was exposed to early, I became very conscious of how I relate to people. I always guide my heart over God in my heart. And I got to a point that I, I would long, I always long for sisters that are really, <laughs> that really genuinely want to work with God. You know, not um, because of the fame of the church space, but that really loves God genuinely from, from the depth of the heart. And it was something, was my heart cried for a very, very, very long time. But then recently, the Lord asked me to join, commanding the morning, and then before you know it, I joined the Ivory class. And here I am. It's been a tr it's been tremendous. It's been wonderful, sister. In fact, it's not only been a positive impact in my life. It's been a positive impact in my family, even to my husband. I thank you for the teaching today. It. I can't. If I begin to go into one after the other, all all about. Eight questions were all answered in different dimensions. Thank you so much God for today. I really appreciate it. Praise you. God. Anybody Thank else? <laughs> Anybody else? Please, um, yes, Tanene. Praise God. Hallelujah. Um, there's something that has stuck with me, and it's the fact that when you serve, mm. when it's time for you to be served, mm. someone will serve you. Mm. Because especially when you're someone who you see yourself always giving, giving. I remember when I was turning 54 in February, one of the things I put out there on social media was, honestly, sometimes I wish I had an older sister. Because it's almost as if you're the one who is always... And today, you know, I've, I, I got this thing back then, you know, like, it's not for you. Just keep doing what you are doing. And when uh, Madame Anosede said, don't be afraid to take off that toga. Because mm. you matter to God. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, that was really something. And something else, when she was talking about the encouragement cycle, and she said, encouragement is mutuality. Mm -hmm. So, you know, sometimes you get to the point where you encourage so much that you don't think this person can give me what I want. Mm -hmm. And surprisingly, you know, what she said here is really true. In recent times, I've been feeding off younger people. And it's it's changed for me. I was like, see me. You know how I feel? It's an older sister I needed at that point. I didn't know that. I should have just spoken to God about it, which I eventually did. And the answers were like, my daughter was around on the table with my younger sister. And the thing I bothered about most, they went straight talking about it. It was like, God, so you saw me in that place when I thought I knew it all. And I didn't think I should bother with whatever counsel they had to give. So I just want to thank God for, you know, it's like reiterating what I was gradually beginning to see, mm -hmm. that just serve. When it's time for you to be served, God knows how to do it. Praise thank God. you. God bless you. Thank you. Hallelujah. Um, Star Ekanem, please, can you come? You're, who is rounding off this show today? Is it you? Uh, no. Um, is she the one taking the pledge, yes. uh, the manifesto? Yes. And then after that, um, please remember, uh, if you look on your chair, there's an offering envelope. Please give your offering if you would like to. God bless you. Please don't leave. We have food for you. I don't have a freezer big enough to take all your food. It's Jesus. I used to beg you. My dear sisters, thank you very much for your time.
thank you everyone for staying up until this time. Before me, I have our manifesto. And, oh, okay, good. So I don't block the screen, I'll just stand over here. At the count of three, we'll say it together. When you get to the dotted lines, of course, you're meant to insert your name. If you can, please, I would encourage you to rise up to your feet as we take the manifesto. It's titled, I am your sister. And we shall do that at the count of three. Okay. One, two, three. I, Oluwato Yogechelumide, will defer to the existing one, Jehovah, the one true God, all wise and all knowing God, and stand in awe of him. I will worship him with extravagant respect and feeling of adoring regard. I will guard, observe, and give heed to his voice. I will watch, I will watch for him, wait for him, treasure up his instructions, celebrate the lessons he teaches me and the laws he writes on my heart and perform what I have learned. He has given me the power to perceive, to understand. He summons me to listen with the intent to obey. I am a sister, and I will live as one to another sister. I will see, value, care for, nurture, cheer on, celebrate, and rejoice with. I will be truthful and sincere too. I will cover. I will stay close to another sister and help her succeed. I am clear that we are more alike than we are different. Together we are more. Together we will go far. I will commit to continue to walk and work with God, even as I work and work with my sister. If Jesus tarries, together we will deliver on the dreams of our hearts and God's names will be glorified. I am your sister, and I am grateful you are my sister too. Please feel free to hug a sister standing behind, beside you. Just know that officially you are now a sister rapper. Yes, let the hogs keep going on. Let the hogs keep going on.